Good evening, everybody. Could everybody remain standing, please? Uh, can we observe a minute's silence following the recent passing of former councillor John Carter, who was elected to the North Shields and Riverside wards between 1995 and 2004 and served as deputy mayor and chair of the council? Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. I received apologies for, for absence from Councillor Jim Allen, Councillor Kath Davis, Councillor Frank Lott, and Councillor Parker Leonard. Any more apologies for absence? Uh, Chair, uh, Councillor Ken Barry. Thank you. In three declarations of interest, can I remind members they have a regible or non-regible interest in matters appearing on the agenda and the nature of the interest they must declare verbally in respect of any item of business to be discussed at the meeting and the nature of such interest. You are also invited to disclose any dispensations from the, from the requirement and declare regible or non-regible interests and have been, have been granted to you in the respect of any matters appearing on the agenda. Um, Chair, just to take guidance, please, um, on item number five, the pay policy. Um, a member of my family works for the authority. That's okay, Councillor Bond. The next item is uh, Council Minutes from the last meeting, the 20th of January and the 17th of February. Can we agree the minutes? Agreed. Agreed. Item number five. <coughs> Sorry, four. <laughs> it's got five to one, yeah. Next item is motions. Uh, five valid motions have been received. In what urgent motion? Um, can I motion number one? Can I invite the mayor to move this motion, please? Thank you, Chair. I do hope that you can all support this motion of commendation for Phil Scott, Director of Environment, Housing and Measure. Phil has provided outstanding service to both the council and our residents for the past 42 years with professionalism, dedication, and of course, humor. He is highly respected by members and colleagues alike, both locally and regionally. Next month, Phil retires from the council, and it is only right that the council recognizes his extraordinary service through this unprecedented cross-party motion of commendation. Thank you, Chair. Do you have a second for the motion? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, on, on this side, we're very happy to um, support and co-sponsor this motion with the elected mayor. Uh, Phil has worked for the council for over four decades, uh, and we're sure he's looking forward to a richly deserved retirement. Um, certainly on this side of the chamber, we've all found Phil to be approachable, supportive, and able to help. Um, and I've always been impressed with his capacity to get things done 
uh, in, a, in, a, in a productive and positive way. I think we all know it's sometimes a challenge working with elected members um, for various reasons. But I've got to say, and we could, I'm sure all of us can agree, that, that Phil has exercised his, his, his role with the greatest level of professionalism, with the greatest humour, uh, and, and with a real focus on the residents of North Tyneside. Um, so we thoroughly commend Phil for his work over the, the, the past years, uh, and we want to wish him all the very best for the future, and we'll certainly be supporting this motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brockbank. Can I now invite members to speak the motion? Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, my personal uh, involvement with Phil started in 2013. Uh, once elected mayor, uh, had been uh, elected in a uh, position, she asked me to be our forces champion. And uh, shortly afterwards, Phil became head of uh, service. And there was a gentleman called Eric Healy who worked at the council at the time as well. And uh, we used to have monthly meetings, and poor Phil was bombarded by what we were going to do, where we were going to go. And it, uh, it culminated in the, the authority getting the gold award. And we went to London with the new um, armed forces officer, Laura Potter, to receive it. And Phil's done a lot for veterans, and uh, it's much appreciated. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Cox. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, like many members here tonight, I've known Phil for many years over a long period and had the opportunity to benefit from his knowledge and experience in commitment to the Council and the residents of North Tyneside. However, since I became Cabinet Member for Housing, I've had the opportunity of working with him even closer and have been able to see how he leads a team of highly committed staff as a team player. This often shows up during our weekly briefings and ad hoc meetings, while focused on getting the job done and dealing with the issues that come up. It's obvious that the rest of the team he leads respect him and in turn he respects them and encourage them at every stage. There are two things that stand out to me about Phil. The first is his ability to look at a complicated scenario and be able to see the real issue and identify a solution and a way forward. The second is his natural sense of humour, which at some stage tends to appear whenever you're with Phil. To end, Chair, I just want to say a big personal thanks to Phil for all the help he has given me over the years, but particularly during my time as Cabinet Member. He's going to be a big miss. However, I also look forward to reading his weekly posts in the local press regarding the quality of council services since he left. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Yes, Chairman. I would uh, just like to say to Phil, um, knowing you, I think, from, for, through from the 1980s to present time, uh, holding councillor, elected mayor, and councillor again, it's a pretty good goal. Uh, but I can say, Frank, uh, Phil, you have always been, regardless of which, which party, whatever position any of us have held, a really good friend. You always ensured all the information was given to us. And I know, you know, as you used to say to me, well, I'll have to tell you everything because you know everything anyway. <laughs> and I would just like to thank you very much. Uh, for all of the support that you gave me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hartley. Councillor Pigard. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Like Councillor Hartley, in, uh, I joined the Council in 1982, so Phil was still an apprentice at that time, and I've worked with him in a number of uh, the roles that he's had through, through housing and also through as a, a director. I've always found Phil to be great company, as well as being a very professional person in the council. I uh, also knew him when he was smaller, before he had his operation, he came another two inches taller, which for anybody that knows Phil, that was quite a pain on the neck as you sit and talk to him, but never mind. One of the big things that sticks out with Phil, though, is the fact that his, his, his love for North Tyneside, and the fact that he's very proud of the area he lives in, and he wants to see things actually getting done. But despite all the times we had on housing, despite all the times we had as, as executive director, I still think that the best time you remember the most is when me and him picked the colour for the balustrades on the, on the promenade down, down in Whitley Bay, and I think we were proved right. So, Phil, every, every success, and hope you have a very good and happy retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pickard. Councillor Carol Burris. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, yes, it's, um, it's great this evening to pay tribute to um, somebody who was as tall as Phil. Um, the story I have for Phil, and he knows, he knows what I'm going to say, but I've known Phil for 30 years on this council, and uh, he's, done, he's worked tirelessly in all aspects and all different kinds of work that he's done, even to the point when he's uh, come out to the ward that I represent, um, and we could, it was a packed with residents, um, and it was a public meeting, and everybody was grappling around for a chair, and the only chair we could find for Phil was a small school chair. And, and he was sat with his chin touching his knees, um, and he's known in Valley Ward as the gentle giant of North Tyneside. But well done, Phil. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burst. Councillor Green? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, again, like um, Councillor Picard, I'm one of those people who were around when Phil was an apprentice. I think he was an apprentice in one of the buildings up in Dudley that was a school at the time. And um, it's now got houses built on it, so it's a long time. I think Phil's also an example of one of those people who have um, grown up, like a, what I call a homegrown person. They have come up through the ranks, through leisure, through uh, various uh, different departments, um, and always, always put North Tyneside first in the interests of the council first. Um, I uh, felt a sympathy with Phil when he got his knees done because I was having my hips done at the same time, so we <laughs> had a bit of a joke uh, with it, but um, well, we still got over it, Phil, that's all right. But I do wish Phil all the very best. He's, he's just been one of those people who you could absolutely go to if you wanted to know something. Um, possibly something get done or just go and see Phil. Now that sounds a bit sort of, you know, but Phil always took what you were saying uh, and tried to do something with it. He was very firm as well, I have to say. There were times when you knew you couldn't go past asking that because Phil would say no. So, you know, that's, that's something that I do really appreciate. Um, but I wish Phil all the very best. I'm sure we'll see you around, Phil. Thank you very much for all the service you've given to this council and all the um, support and friendship you've given to the many people uh, who are sitting here in the, in the room. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Carl Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't around in 1982 when Phil joined the council. Um, in fact, I wasn't born for another 11 years after that. So um, I can't pay tribute to Phil as long as some of our colleagues have known him. Um, but on behalf of the entire Labour group, I just want to put on thanks, our record, thank, record our thanks to Phil. Um, personally, when I joined the Cabinet, Phil was, my, Phil was my officer. My, my portfolio was entirely within Phil's remit. Um, and I certainly, when I became the Deputy Mayor last year and moved out of Phil's remit, and I mean Phil both miss our time sitting talking about parking because we did unprecedented levels of parking queries during the two years that I sat under Phil's remit. And it's definitely Phil's thing that he'll miss the least about the council when he goes. Uh, but on behalf of the Labour Group, we want to put on record our thanks to Phil for all his extent, outstanding service in North Tyneside. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, the people of North Tyneside and the members have been well served by Phil Scott. Um, he is my chief officer for the next week or so, week or two, and um, he's served me very well as a relatively new cabinet member. He's kept me right. Um, he's shown great strategy and great leadership within his role, and I want to thank him for all he's done for North Tyneside. And I'm sure it will go on because he won't take his eye off. He'll be watching whatever we're doing. So thank you very much, Phil. And have a good and long and happy retirement. Thank you, Councillor Graham. I think I can reflect on all of that and concur with everything everybody said. Phil, you're going to be a massive miss. <laughs> have a long and happy retirement. Move the motion to exercise the right to reply. Should we go straight to the vote then? <laughs> I just want to say, there's not many people, Phil, where all these councillors would stand up and say fantastic things about them, to be quite honest. Um, you know, when people say you're a star, I don't know what kind of star you are, but in many of our eyes, to be, you've been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you.
Could we now go to the vote? <laughs> and now move on to the urgent motion. Uh, could I invite Councillor Carl Johnson to move the motion, please? You can, thank you, Chair. Um, I am delighted to be again proposing a cross-party motion in this chamber, unprecedented, truly unprecedented, two in the same evening. But this is a motion which is sadly of a much more serious nature. Um, the sovereignty of the people of Ukraine has been constantly under threat now by the Russian Federation. It is a truly shocking situation that is unfolding there right now. Vladimir Putin is nothing more than a war criminal, and he should be treated as such. We stand in total solidarity with the people of Ukraine on this stand, with complete and utter solidarity against the Russian Federation. We also want to open our home arms to those people fleeing Ukraine, and we'll work cross-party to ensure we can provide the best possible service to any, of, any, any people from Ukraine that feel that end up in North Tyneside. We will work on them with open arms and give them the best possible service. So I'd like to propose this motion tonight, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Brockbank, would you like to second the motion? Uh, yes, Chair, thank you very much. And as Councillor Johnson says, I think this is possibly unprecedented. We've had two cross-party motions uh, this evening. Um, we're very, very pleased to support this. Um, it's quite frankly a, a huge shame that we need to bring this motion at all, um, and it, it, it's required. Um, when, you look, when we look back over the past decades, it, looks, it appears that world leaders have learned very little. Uh, we see a history repeating itself uh, in, in the Ukraine as it was in, in Eastern Europe in the Second World War and in, in Western Europe in the First World War. The invasion of the Ukraine is, is little more than a genocidal war crime uh, motivated by a dictator who values human life so cheaply. From Hitler to Stalin, from Mao to Pol Pot, land grabs based on false claims and false ideologies are entirely wrong and devalue all of our humanity. The British people have responded uh, with its usual, usual generosity and openness from providing aid to offering their homes uh, to refugees who, who uh, sadly have to leave their own. Um, I'm sure absolutely the North Tyneside will play its part in welcoming refugees from the Ukraine. Um, and what we're asking for in this motion, it might seem a simple token, um, but for us uh, it, it is symbolic. It, 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 it goes far, far beyond words and letters and, and all the rest of it and even our differences of politics. Uh, this, this, this motion rejects uh, Putin's expansionism, the terror um, of hospitals and nurseries being bombed uh, as a, as a, as a um, bona fide uh, method of war uh, and oppression. Um, Churchill said the soul of freedom is deathless. It cannot and will not perish. And I think tonight all of us in this chamber can stand in solidarity with the people of the Ukraine. Uh, and, and remind ourselves that those freedom fighters uh, deserve our support, our respect, uh, and our prayers at this very, very difficult time. We're very happy to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Brockbank. Can I now invite members to speak the motion? Councillor Thurlow. Thank you, Chair. Um, I didn't intend to speak during this debate, um, but what we're doing tonight, ex um, exercising our democratic rights, debating, exchanging conflicting ideas, disagreeing with each other. That's what the Ukrainian people are fighting for right now. And I think it's a great reminder about our own freedoms and our own liberties and solidarity to the, to the Ukrainian people. Thank you, Councillor Thurlowe. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chairman, and I will be supporting the notice of motion. The United Kingdom continues to stand in solid solidarity with our Ukrainian friends. And we all understand the strength of public opinion on this matter. 
The Russian attack on Ukraine is an unprovoked and anti-democratic act of aggression and I, like so many others, are appalled by the conduct of Putin's expansionist regime. It has been impossible to see the images and hear the stories coming from the right, right across the Ukraine and not feel sad, to say the least. Anger and a desire to help and support our friends. The UK government, with the support of all parties of the House of Commons, has already provided a wealth of ongoing support to President Zelensky in the form of the humanitarian and military aid. At the same time, our country is also opening its borders to Ukraine refugees to help rehouse and settle them and give them protection from Putin's war. The Homes for Ukraine scheme announced the other day will allow individuals, charities, community groups and businesses in the UK to bring Ukrainians to safety, including those who have no family ties in the UK. Phase one of the, the scheme will allow sponsors in the UK to nominate a named Ukrainian or a named Ukrainian family to stay with them in their home or in the separate properties. And it is a mark of the British people that in the first 48 hours of the scheme opening, more than 122,000 people have registered to help. This is in addition to the toughest set of economic sanctions ever to be placed on the Russian regime. The UK and its NATO allies are all clear in their objective. Putin must fall. As a, count, as a country, we are leading the international response to reporting Ukraine in the face of Putin's attack. But we should always do more to make it easier for Ukrainians to come into the UK through the Ukraine Family Scheme. Ukrainians will, with passports will get permission to come here online and will be given their biometric card once they've arrived in Britain, meaning they no longer need to physically visit visa application centres, which has been a huge issue. This is allowing immigration staff to focus their efforts on helping those without passports. This will make the process quicker and simpler, helping Ukrainians fleeing Putin's aggressions while keeping the British people safe. Overnight, the Ukrainian Prosecutor's uh, General's office, office said that 103 children have been killed since the invasion began, with over 100 more wounded and 400 education buildings bombed. The idea that this is conflict is being confined to military targets is nonsense. <coughs> and such actions act as a stain on Putin and his undemocratic regime. Overnight, President Biden described Putin as a war criminal. <laughs> I think he is right. It's all up to us to stand together, shoulder to sh shoulder, with President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people to ensure that this democratic attack on the sovereign nation falls. And I support the motion put forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Orkney. Councillor Newman. Thank you, Chair. I'm really glad this is going as a cross-party motion because today is not a day to be political. It's a day to stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine against Putin and against his illegal war. I'm probably one of those generations who thought that since the last conflict in Kosovo, that war was something Europe would never see again, that large-scale warfare, humanitarian crisis and refugee crisis was something for the Middle East, for Asia. I never thought it would happen in Europe. But if I can say there is one ray of light, and that is the people of Ukraine standing bravely against the Russian bear. The, the Russian bear that's supposed to be one of the most powerful militaries in the world. 
And you have a leader staying to defend his people. You have his people, ordinary people, not soldiers, hairdressers, barbers, tax accountants, lawyers, preparing to defend their country. If that is not something to warm our hearts and show that there is hope, then I don't know what else will. I think the Ukrainian people have shown incredible strength, determination, and I cannot understand how Putin cannot look at what he's doing and, and retreat. He's got no hope in this place. They will defend to the end their nation. And I only, I only think that whilst I, I acknowledge that, there's nothing more that NATO can do. NATO can't get involved directly. The only thing for evil to exist in the world, as I was always taught, is that for good people to stand by and do nothing. And the British people have done all they can, standing humanitarian aid, and this motion, however small, shows that we will stand against evil and stand for freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Councillor Cox. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Chair, I just wanted to point out that North Tyneside has a long tradition of welcoming households who have found themselves at risk from war or other things from various parts of the world. As a council and with the support of our res residents and other organisations, both professional and voluntary, we have stepped up to support these people at their point of most need. We all remember the tragic images from Syria and Afghanistan, and I am proud to say that we have we've supported families from both of those areas as well as others and give them a safe place to live and support them and help them to rebuild their lives, and we continue to do so. We now see further tragic images on our TVs of people in great need of support. I want to reassure members here, but more importantly our residents, that this council will and actually already is stepping up to help those in need of help and a safe place to live. We have already had a, had a family arrive from Ukraine in need of a, a place that's safe to live and needs our support. The family, arrived, um, the family arrived as they already have a family member who lives in North Tyneside and who works in North Tyneside and they just turned up and needed our support and I'm proud to say that this council has stood up and has given them the support they need at the, at the time when they need it most. As I'm sure you'll all be aware, this is a fast moving situation and we are doing all we can to get as much information from central government as possible. However, I can assure you that we will deal with the issues as they arise and do all we need to do to make people safe as our first priority. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor Burris. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been overwhelmed by the generosity of North Tyneside residents who have once again demonstrated what a fantastic borough we live in and we should all be proud of that. I know of many examples where people have given to the national charities and to these, and this continues to be the best way of challenging humanitarian support to the people of Ukraine. However, we have also seen nine tonnes of donated goods which left North Tyneside for live on Tuesday. A fantastic collaboration between residents and businesses. I have also heard of local examples of people registering to host people from Ukraine. I know that we have previously opened our borough to families from other war-torn war areas of the world and will use the experience gained from that to help again. Council should know the services within my portfolio area to take part in this collective borough-wide effort which has gathered unprecedented momentum. We know that our community and voluntary sector is second to none and will be there and relationships have been galvanised during the recent responses to the global coronavirus pandemic with the simple objectives of helping people. And our partners who form our local community safety partnership, um, which is the Safer North Tyneside, will be responding in the best way they can. Um, I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burris. Anybody else like to speak to the motion? Can I move the motion exercise right to apply? Thank you, Chair. I am absolutely delighted that this motion looks to be passing with complete unanimity and cross party support. I have been to Ukraine on a number of occasions, Chair, and I've been to Lviv, Kharkiv, Kiev, and Chernesky. 
a number of those cities mentioned are now vastly different to what they were when I was there between 2014 and 15. Those were cities of freedom, of democracy, and who had just had to fight for their life. This was just post Euromaidan in 2013-14, when the government of Yankovic was overthrown because Ukraine values its freedom and democracy to decide what, that wants, what it wants to do as a nation. Those cities now are war zones, some absolutely demolished, but still standing absolutely resolute behind the strength of their nation and will end the fight of their lives. Igor, my friend from Lviv, um, his family originated from Mariupol. Um, we've all seen the images coming out of Mariupol recently. Um, he returned home to fight recently um, and sadly lost his life last week. Um, so it's really difficult and that's a, the real world situation. All the people of Ukraine are facing some delight at this motion will pass with cross party support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Can I now move to the vote, please? All those in favour? You know, thank you very much. Let's move the motion number two, which is marked as number two. Uh, could I invite Councillor Samuel to speak to the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. I am putting this motion forward to address concerns felt by a number of people at the scale of fraud that appears to have taken place during the pandemic. Estimates put the extent of this at an eye-watering level of over four billion, and the same eyes raised their brows when it became apparent that the Chancellor appeared to have little appetite to pursue it. There was a broad cross-party support for the support offered to businesses and for the furlough scheme at the start of lockdown. Quite clearly, we want to avoid the loss of jobs and threats to businesses that might follow. We all agreed that there should, be a, should not be an overcomplicated process to get this support. In that situation, it was accepted that there may be some grey areas and the potential for some fraud is always going to be there with grey areas. But there are now widespread concerns that money has been claimed in situations where there was no damage to normal business through the impacts of the pandemic, that the extent of this fraud may have gone so much further than anybody thought. There are also increasing claims that the furlough scheme, which provided a lifeline to the hospitality industry, was misused, and some people continue to work whilst on furlough, possibly at the insistence of their employer. It's always vital that such scheme attracts wide public support and confidence, that some people don't think they are unsupported when they feel that others were being over-supported. So it's important that we make clear that we, we, we make a clear stand on this issue. With COVID numbers rising again, none of us can know what will happen in the weeks ahead. There may well be and probably will be pandemics in the years to come. We need to learn the lessons of the experience, and one of them must be to ensure that um, public money, which was misspent or stolen, is recovered. So it is important that we as Council do three things. One, express a disappointment that Rishi Sunak is not showing more determination in pursuing this fraud. Confirm that its inactivity and this is damaging and his failure to pursue this means a compensatory tax rises in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Express our unanimous, unanimous condemnation of those in North Tyneside and beyond who are complicit in any way in this fraud. And three, insist that the government names and shames those, those who are found to have been in any way complicit in fraudulent activity around COVID support. And I do hope that we can be unanimous on this issue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Samuel. Councillor Wilson, would you like to second the motion? Yes, please. And if I could speak to the motion as well. Thank you. With this uh, motion, we're focusing on... Uh, fraud within the government's uh, COVID loan scheme. We bear in mind that the figure of £4 billion is only part of a wider story of waste and mismanagement of taxpayer money during the pandemic, uh, including useless PPE and enormous consultancy fees. When we use numbers like millions and billions, it's hard to get a true grasp on them. So I've been trying to bring this down to earth with a few back-of-the-envelope calculations. £4 billion would underwrite the Council's general fund budget for 25 years. £4 billion is equivalent to all the money we raise in Council tax over 60 years. £4 billion is equivalent to all the money we raise through business rates in about 133 years. With £4 billion we could underwrite the cost of our adult social care budget for 80 years or our children's social care for 200 years. We could resurface over 
10,000 miles of road. I won't go on. My point is simple. The Labour Administration of North Tyneside works tirelessly through close and effective working relationships with senior officers to deliver highly efficient and highly effective services for our residents. And yet we constantly hear proposals from members opposite alleging waste of various kinds, cars and magazines being favourites. Um, if the Conservatives really care about money wasting and really want more funding to be made available to the hardworking people of this borough, then they can join us uh, in this motion in challenging the approach of the laissez-faire Chancellor. He may think that £4 billion is no big deal. Well, I don't think the people of North Tyneside agree. £4 billion is a big deal to them, and especially in the midst of the biggest cost of living crisis since the Thatcher era. <coughs> So in summary, the United Kingdom Treasury cannot afford to be laid back about fraud. Those who have misappropriated public funds in the midst of a pandemic, nonetheless, need to be pursued and any money fraudulently obtained must be recovered. I trust all members will support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Can I now invite members to speak to the motion, please? Councillor Bartoli. Thank you, Chair. From the beginning of the COVID crisis, the government has acted proactively to protect jobs, livelihoods, businesses and public services across the UK. The COVID job retention scheme and the self-employed income support scheme alone support the income and self-employed businesses of almost 14 million people. The government was in an unprecedented position and had to make some difficult decisions to balance access to these schemes and others with the ability to release money quickly without red tape in order to rapidly protect people's income, whilst being robust enough to minimise potential fraud. To suggest that the Treasury has no appetite to recover this money is wrong. In fact, the levels of fraud suggested in the motion is already out of date, as the Chancellor recently announced that under measures already taken by the Treasury, this figure has already been reduced to 3.2 billion. Whilst this figure is high, it still only represents a small percentage of the over 400 billion handed out during the pandemic and is in line with HMRC's original planning assumptions that informed the design and operational management of these schemes. It was clear these schemes would be targets for fraud and that customers would make mistakes, and that's why HMRC, with the Treasury, designed the schemes to prevent as much fraud as possible before any payments were made, while still supporting quickly those who needed it. I remind our Labour colleagues that they supported these schemes throughout and at no point suggested that more checks or more bureaucracy were needed to reduce the levels of fraud. When asked about this recently, Rishi Sunak stated at the dispatch box he could categorically say no one has written this figure off and we are going after it. Indeed, the Treasury has already has a plan in place and is actively recovering this debt. The government has invested over 100 million in a taxpayer protection tax, tax force of 1,265 HMRC staff to combat fraud in these schemes. They're expected to recover between 800 million and a billion between 2021 and 23 alone, in addition to the 536 million in 20 to 21. So whilst on both sides of the chamber we agree that recovery of this money is important, we do not accept the premise that our Chancellor does not have the appetite. And far from being dismayed at the progress made, we on this side, who seem to get our facts and figures from the Treasury rather than the press, are impressed with the speed and scale of the recovery already, as well as the plans for the future. Now, we always admire the moves of this motion's eagerness to protect the public's money in, Mes in Westminster. I just wish they protected the public's money in North Tyneside with the same cautiousness. Councillor Wilson just rightly decried waste and overspend in Westminster. If we want to find criminal waste of money in North Tyneside, we need look no further than the quarter of a million pounds proposed to be spent on five concrete memorial cir circles or the one and a half million pound death trap roundabout at Rake Lane. Once again, the Labour Party seemed to want to hold the government to a standard for which they themselves fall woefully short. For these reasons, we will not be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Bartoli. Would anybody else like to speak to the motion? The we'll move on motion now. Sorry, Councillor Johnson. Sorry, Chair, I'd just like to challenge Councillor Bartoli on some of his comments there. Death trap roundabout. Professional engineers have designed that roundabout, <coughs> signed off with money from your government. That is your government paying for that roundabout. 
not a waste of money for the North Downs taxpayers. It is your government in ring fence funds that cannot be spent on anything else, paying for that roundabout, designed by officers who I have the complete trust in in this council in terms of their professional ability to design it. Co-designed with Sustrans, the national body for tra sustainable transport. It's also going to be signed off by the new seller for Transport England, Chris Boardman, who will sign all active travel fund schemes off. So to refer to it as a death trap roundabout is disgraceful. You can disagree with the roundabout, absolutely. Have raised comments on it. To say it's a death trap is completely and utterly wrong. I'm also dismayed at £250,000 for stone, as he called a waste. What he's referring to there is memorials to people who have died from COVID. So you telling every single family in this borough that a memorial, which they overwhelmingly supported at public consultation, that that is a waste of money, a place where families in this borough will go to remember the dead. Are you telling me that is just useless stones and a waste of money? Because I know certainly the many, many members, family around this borough that have lost loved ones who will very much appreciate a memorial, a lasting, fitting memorial that is fit for purpose and useful rather than simply stoned. It's a memorial to those that have lost, we've lost during the pandemic, Chair. Chair, Chair point of order, I, I must take exception at the fact that I decried the uh, establishment of the memorials what I was complaining about was the extravagant cost spent on a memorial that we proposed spending almost nothing on in the way of trees, which would have been more environmentally conscious, better for our residents, more accessible. And, in, and again, this, this administration has wasted quite a point of order, the meant to refer to a section in the Constitution, and I don't hear a section of the Constitution haven't been referred to so far. That's good. Yeah, it's not... It's not a point of order. Uh, Councillor Rankin? Yeah, it's just to point out the fact that that design at Rake Lane is actually government approved design. So I think we'll bring a motion through Council next time, which we can write to the Minister to, to lay, relay your criticism to him, and we'll get a response from him as to what he thinks about the criticism that you've made. I do notice that Conservative activists have also put questions to, um, to residents on social media um, asking why can't we take the money for the roundabout and use it to fill potholes? It's really quite straightforward, as we've explained before, because it would be illegal. So what you're actually proposing doing is you're actually proposing an illegal use of public funds, taking something which has been grant awarded um, for using it for something which is completely different. So, and as with, with regard to the, the memorials, the COVID memorials, um, the idea that they're just stone. So are war memorials just stone? Because if you speak to a lot of people, COVID has been a war. If you speak to people who've worked in the NHS and who've actually worked in this local authority, continue to deliver services, it's been a type of war. And it's a fitting memorial because it's not just for the people who died, it's for people whose lives were turned upside down by this, by this pandemic, something which happens once every 100 years, give or take. Um, the idea that you can describe that just as stone is just absolutely abhorrent. Councillor Newman. Thank you, Chair. I just think it's uh, great to see normal players resumed. Um, look, look, I mean, this £4 billion pounds road off, £3.2 billion, pound, uh, you know, sorry, £4 billion pound worth of uh, fraud, £3.2 billion pound worth of fraud. It's an exceptional amount of money. Now, in fairness, I was one of those people who did get put on furlough. So, credit where credit's due. I was put on furlough, I benefited from it, so I understand that there was a need between checks and getting money out. I understand that. But the haphazard way that they've approached clawing back fraud is a great concern. Now, if you don't agree with some of the politics behind this, put an amendment into the motion and say, actually, I think we should be looking more at the fraud. But there's no reason why we can't together say, well, £3.2 billion is an excessive amount of money lost to fraud. We need to do more. So I, I think we should all vote for in favour of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Councillor Brockbank. Th uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, as Conservatives, we, we always would support uh, a, an approach or whereby public money is wisely spent, prudently spent, and certainly if uh, money has been falsely claimed uh, or portioned, we would always, always support means of recovering that. Um, 
and that's something that, that as Conservatives, we, 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 we recognise as an important cornerstone of our political philosophy, that state money should be wisely spent and should be spent appropriately. Um, but it's got to be acknowledged, as Councillor Bartoli said, that this government uh, has faced unprecedented uh, decisions in unprecedented times. Uh, this government has released billions upon billions uh, to support workers uh, during COVID and has uh, sought to support businesses. And I would say that they've done that in a proactive, responsive and responsible uh, way. However, as, you, as is rightly said, those who have made false claims um, are guilty of fraud. This is the, 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 the motion asks for the Chancellor to take action. In fact, this is this, what, what fraud is, is a criminal activity. It's incumbent upon the police to investigate uh, the, the, this, this action. The Chancellor sets out the policy agenda, as Councillor Bartoli has rightly said. There's already been a clawback of fraudulent claimed uh, grants. Uh, and that will that will continue. Um, but to say that the Chancellor um, it, it should sh do anything other than what he is doing is, I think, slightly disingenuous. I think I think the government's doing everything it can do, uh, and it's certainly open um, to to make sure that taxpayers' money is wisely spent. Um, we would have no problem in general terms supporting this motion if it was apolitical, but sadly with the Labour group as usual, um, serious issues get turned into political playthings. Um, but I would just challenge some of the points that have been made. When Councillor Wilson talks about a laissez-faire Chancellor um, who doesn't seem bothered uh, about spending, um, sorry to hop back to the, the Blair and Brown era, but we'll take no lessons from Labour about wasteful spending. And we certainly presented a budget that was balanced, sensible, and would have saved residents an awful lot more money than uh, Labour have suggested. So we'll take no lessons from Councillor Wilson on that. Um, and as Councillor Bartoli has touched upon in terms of COVID itself as a wider issue, an important issue, of course we support uh, memorial, the memorial scheme. Of course we do. What we were saying is that in, in our conversations with residents that the planting of trees would be a more meaningful activity, um, they would grow over time, they would be, it'd be environmentally more friendly, it would be more sustainable, be more accessible, uh, and it would be a slightly more appropriate way of, of managing this. So to make out Councillor Bartoli's uh, comments uh, other than anything that, as they were generally meant is frankly disgraceful and playing politics with a very serious issue. Um, so for these reasons, we won't be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Brockbank. Councillor Thurlow, yeah. I'm wondering, um, after what Councillor um, Bartoli said about the, you know, reclaiming this money is actually sort of on track, why would the minister who was responsible for actually getting this money, Lord, Ag Lord Agnew, why would he resign and then say, the, gov the Treasury has little interest in the consequences of fraud to our society. Why would he say that? Why would he resign if things were on track? Thank you, Councillor Thurley. Would anybody else like to speak the motion? Sorry. Just a point right of order, there. just a point of order, Chair. I just want to, uh, to say I was with the Lord Lieutenant the other day planting a tree in Richardson Days Park. And I was told that up to now, North Tyneside has planted over 7,000 trees. So we're not doing too bad. Thank you. Can I now invite the move of the motion to exercise the right to reply? Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> the, I haven't really heard much opposition to the, to the, 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 the motion we put forward, other than to suggest that um, we've recovered a little bit of the money, so it's all right. Um, which I don't find convincing. I'm not going to even go, and go into the, the COVID memorial thing because it, I find that somewhat distasteful, to be honest. So I'm not, I'm not going to go, in, to go there. What I do find very odd is that every time we have a debate like this, the, the Conservative group's examples of waste tend to be things that this local authority hasn't actually paid for at all in terms of the roundabout, in terms of the morph statues, in terms of many other examples. The only things you can find to criticise us wasting money on are things that we haven't actually spent wasted money on at all which is particularly bizarre. Um, so, I mean, the, the whole point of this is that um, if COVID money has been spent improperly, um, then all sides of this council should be accepting that that is against the law and we should, be, we, we should be stamped out and we should be doing our best to recover all the £4 billion pounds we can in Ireland, just a fraction of it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Samuel. Can we now move to the board, please? All those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Motion goes through 45 to 8. Motion number 3, can I invite Councillor Rankin to move the motion please? Thank you Chair. It's a 2-1 to unanimous at the moment, so let's see if we can get 3-1. This motion stems from the recent budget debate where an unfairness was highlighted in how central government provides funding to North Tyneside. It details very clearly that North Tyneside received 17% less than the average for English councils in the latest financial settlement measured on the core spending power calculation. Ours is also the lowest in the LA7. Core spending power is the calculation central government uses to measure the resources available for service delivery. This year, yet again, North Tyneside adopted a balanced budget which did not cut any key services and maintained our operating state of libraries, leisure centres, swimming pools and customer first centres, whilst also protecting the most vulnerable in our borough. We live in an amazing place. The least we should expect is to receive average funding packages. This motion calls on the Mayor to write to the Chancellor asking him to end this funding injustice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Councillor Early, will you like to second the motion? Thank you, Chair. The Institute for Fiscal Studies report English local government funding trends and challenges in 2019 and beyond concluded that the current arrangement for local authority funding may sound like they treat all councils equally, but this does not account for the fact that different councils rely on these revenues for, to very different extents to bolster the revenues they receive from council tax and retain business rates and revenue, revenue growth. Whilst true that core spending per dwelling in the most deprived council areas is still 1.3 times the level of that in the least deprived areas, this is down from 1.6 uh, times in 2009 to 2010. Increasingly, current funding arrangements mean that there is a growing disparity between core spending power and the service demand pressures and needs within the council's local population. It is then left to councils such as North Tyneside to try and resolve this increasing mismatch between funding and the demand for its services. Whilst North Tyneside <coughs> does not have the highest level of deprivation in the region, it does face a rapidly increasing level of demand for adult and children social care services. And as the motion says, the authority faces an increasing challenge in meeting these increasing levels of demand when faced with the tri triple impediments of lower than average core spending power, government forced council tax increases and massive cuts in grant funding. There is an increasingly urgent need for the government to further review its methodology for the award of core spending for local authorities such as North Tyneside and for that reason I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Early. Can I invite members to speak the motion? Councillor Wallace. Thank you Chairman. Uh, Chairman, we don't accept the basis of this motion and thus cannot support it. Figures clearly show that the core spending power for the Council in 2016-17 to 17 was £158.686 million and it's risen each year. By 2021, it was £180.533 million. That's a very significant increase. The reference to government-forced Council tax rises in the motion is simply untrue. There has been no compulsion to raise council tax year after year, as Mayor Redfern and her colleagues have chosen to do. As an opposition, we have demonstrated how the council tax could be frozen. Other councils, such as Hilling Hillingdon, for example, froze theirs for several years, and this year, Wandsworth Council has reduced theirs. Notably, these are Conservative administrations, unlike the administration here, which seems determined to raise council tax year after year and indeed seems to throw up its hands in horror at the very idea of not charging our, rate pay, our council taxpayers ever larger sums. Ultimately, what matters is the use to which the money is put, and that, like the decision to continually impose tax rises, is a matter of political choice. I cannot support the motion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Wells. Councillor Newman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be supporting this motion because ultimately it has our residents at heart. Uh, at the heart of this as well is, is austerity. And for 12 years, the government has had an obsession with austerity and it's made balancing the Council's finances harder every year. Now, I stand firm in my belief that austerity is unnecessary and in my mind, nothing but a political choice, not an economic necessity. And I will quote, as I've, I've quoted in the past, Professor Paul Krugman, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics, who has stated that all economic research that allegedly supports the austerity push has now been discredited. And he goes on even further to say that every country that introduced significant austerity has had their economy suffer as a result. For me, this shows very clearly that the financial crisis simply gave the Conservative Party the opportunity to impose an ideological drive to shrink the size of the state. Uh, but every time we raise this, we just get empty words. And who else can re remember Prime Minister Theresa May in 2018 declaring triumphantly to her party that austerity is over? Well, if austerity is over, how do we constantly have reductions in our budget? That it makes no sense. Um, it, austerity isn't over, and the government is simply refusing to properly fund local authorities. I'm, I'm going to appeal to the members opposite. Now, I know we have differences of opinions when it comes to austerity, and I'm, I'm not going to try and convince you of my opinion. I stand fast in my belief that austerity was a political choice, not economic necessity. I stand firm in my belief that austerity has worsened the financial crisis created by the big banks and has not made the finances of the country better. I believe wholeheartedly that austerity has led to great misery to our residents and not hope for the future. But even if you don't share my views... I'm going to ask you one question, and that question is, why would you not want more funding for this council? It's something I've never understood about the group opposite. Over the years, we've had many motions in one form or another asking for more funding for this authority. I've myself um, proposed one, Councillor Samuels proposed one, Councillor Rankin's proposed them, and every single time we bring these motions to this council, the party opposite refuses to vote in favour of, of them, essentially refusing to vote in favour of more funding, and I honestly don't understand why. Why would you not want more finances? I understand that you might not agree with me with austerity, but I don't understand why you won't want more money for this, uh, for this council. Um, you're elected to represent the people of North Tyneside, not the Westminster Conservative Party. So I'm going to end by reminding you that those are the people who you represent, and there should be no reason for you to vote in favour of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, this motion is fundamentally about fairness. The calculation on cost spending power per dwelling is supposed to take into account deprivation. North Tyneside is right bang in the middle, pretty much, 77th out of 150 odd authorities for the IMD. Um, Yet, we are certainly not bang in the middle because we are way below the average in terms of cost spending power. We are just asking for our fair share, nothing more. If we had our fair share, we'd have £17.142 million extra to spend, to spend on the things that we know really matter to local residents. I can't see why anybody in this chamber would vote against us. I want to talk about Councillor Wallace's misplaced belief that understanding the core spending power. Councillor Wallace has been in the position as the current finance before. She knows the council's finances. I don't get how she doesn't understand that if you do not put council tax up when the government assumes you put council tax up, that next year there's a gap in your budget. The Conservative group time after time after time have put in flimsy promises that do not work in the real world to try and cover gaps in the budget. Nothing that is year-on-year year savings. It's all one-off desperation to try and play to the public that they can freeze council tax, when in reality they know they have, do not have to do that because they're not in power. Because time and time again in this borough, the good people of North Tyneside return Labour administrations. Since 2013-14, the government have cut 80% of the revenue support grant. Again, placing that burden directly from the government, giving us a revenue grant, replacing that, that, that's not, we can't stop spending that money. That money pays for the core services, social care services, children's services, the environmental services, the core stuff that as authority we absolutely have to do. So with that 80% cut, do we expect us to cut those services 
all what happens is they, they place the burden on the businesses in this borough and the residents of this borough to ask them to pay more council tax. The biggest scam since this government came in is their continued cuts to local authority finances while telling local authorities to put council tax up time and time again. If we hadn't have put council tax up at any point over that period, Councillor Wallace is absolutely right in terms of she says the core spending power has increased. It has. Not only the English average, but it has increased. If we hadn't have put council tax up in that period, we'd now be stuck with the reality is our collection rate would be much closer to the core spending power at the start of this period, and the reality of what the government expects us to have would be much higher. We'd have a £22 million black hole if we hadn't put council tax up in that period. And I'm sure Councillor Wallace, as a prudent fiscal conservative, would not want that. This is fundamentally about fairness. There is politics in the motion, of course there is. But ultimately, this wants to write to Richley Sooner, ask him to increase North Tyneside's per draw and spending power to match the average in all local authorities. It asks for nothing more and nothing less other than our fair share, and I would urge every member to back this motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Steve Cox. <clears throat> yes, Chair. I just want to, want to agree with exactly what Councillor Johnson's just said there and what Councillor Newman said before. We often bring motions to this council and the party opposite vote against them. And it appears to be more to do with protecting the Conservative government rather than trying to support the local residents. As Councillor Johnson has just said, it's very clear what is asked in this motion is simply to write to the Chancellor and asking him to give us and our residents the same average payment <coughs> as the other local authorities in the UK. Why can't it just support that? That's all. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, I'll be supporting this motion and just endorse what my colleagues have already said. I think it's more important than ever in the current context with the impact of COVID. The COVID pandemic has impacted hardest on people who were already struggling in our borough and it's had a massive, massive impact. We will be dealing with that impact for many years to come. Um, so I don't understand why our Tory councillors in North Tyneside are opposing this motion, which would bring additional resources in to support our residents, particularly at the moment as well with rising inflation costs. All the major charities are voicing their serious concern about the impact this is going to have on families and vulnerable people including people living in our borough, and I don't understand at all why the Tories can't support this motion. We need these additional resources now more than ever. I think it just shows what a mockery the levelling up agenda actually is. If we can't even support a motion like this here in North Tyneside, then I just despair. I will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Chris Johnson. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I just want to answer, first of all, the councillor Newman with regard to the fact that we don't want other funding. We do. There isn't a council in the North East that doesn't want funding. Goodness gracious. But let's look at this from a different perspective, actually. Let's look, first of all, at a national perspective. Now, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities announced a funding allocation last October. Now, I know Mr Gove may not be popular with those seated opposite, but let us forget Andy Burnham's admission that he and Mr Gove could work together constructively, and we've seen them do so already. Now, in October, Mr Gove announced that throughout 2022-2023, the government would make available £54.1 billion, which represents, in real terms, an increase of over 4.5% to Council's core spending power. And that includes also a new one-off 822 million grant to support all services delivered to local by local authorities. How is this reflected regionally? So come down from national to regional level. Let me give you some examples. First of all, 100 million allocated to the northeast through the first round of leveling up fund. This will invest in five projects to support local infrastructure to improve local life and boost jobs and growth. Where? Here we go. County Durham, Newcastle, Stockton on Tees, Sunderland. North Tyneside? Exactly. Just wait. Next. 
Future High Street Fund is providing over 98 million to seven high streets in the northeast to support the renewal of high streets and town centres. And where? I'll tell you where. Sunderland City Centre, Bishop Auckland, Blythe, Redcar and Cleveland, Middlesbrough Centre and Stockton. North Tyneside, not in that package of funding, certainly not. And finally, over £7 million has been allocated for 14 projects in North East through the Community Renewal Fund. And where? Four of them in Gateshead, five in Sunderland, two in Tees Valley, two in Durham, uh, two north of the Tyne, but specifically to North Tyneside, none. Chair, point of order. Can Point of order. The council's reading out a list of um, projects that aren't happening in North Tyneside. This is exactly about the, because this is about the funding that comes into North Tyneside, and specifically the funding calculations that the government themselves actually issue. So I, I don't think he's actually speaking to the motion here. You will, if you care to listen me through. Can I, 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 here we go. So, therefore, why is funding going elsewhere? If you'd waited, actually, you waited, followed it. Why is funding going elsewhere? Why, as you claim, does North Tyneside end up with a core spending power less than the average? And we need to be asking ourselves that. It's quite simple. One, more funding is going to areas of greater deprivation, de deprivation than North Tyneside. And that's perfectly valid. Perfectly valid. Secondly, funding is going to local and regional authorities who are showing themselves to be proactive in attracting investments and jobs. Yep. So North Tyneside is actually probably receiving a fair allocation of resources. But do, but do we want more funding? Of course we do. Now you're not going to direct to me and say we don't. I want more funding like you. We want more funding like you. It's the way you go about it that we're criticising. Here we go. There's a much better approach to securing funding. And it's this. One, our two MPs, together with representatives from North Tyneside Council, need to visit Ben Houch One minute, Councillor Johnson. Mayor. One minute. Thank you very much. With a view to learning how to attract government funding. With a view to learning how to attract government funding. I'll repeat that and thereby boost productivity and jobs and pay and living standards. Again, none of that actually forms part of the core spending calculation. It does. None of it. It does. It doesn't. If, if we Can get I... a grant award like that, it does not form part of the core spending calculation, Councillor. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. And secondly, may I also suggest that we don't write to Ricky Sunak to complain yet again because we're relentlessly writing. That's all. I've only been here for one year, and every single motion that comes out from the opposite side is to write to complain instead of doing something constructive. May I suggest that you write, if you must write, to Andy Burnham and seek his advice from a Labour mayor as to how to work constructively with central government and thereby attract the funding that you haven't got. Thank you very much. Councillor Thurlow, Chair, I think I might have slipped into a parallel universe um, <laughs> at some point tonight. Um, it essentially sounds like we're being punished for having a Labour, Labour administration that is willing to speak out and stand up to the government when they're doing something we don't like. Where, where is the fairness in that? It's just outrageous. You know, I'm really, I am quite lost for words that the councillor has just made this ridiculous point about spending. It's just absolutely ridiculous that the idea that we don't have a mayor and we don't have a deputy mayor and we don't have a cabinet that's fighting for jobs and investment, that idea is absolutely ridiculous. I really have slipped into a parallel universe, so I'm going to go, I'm going to try and get to back to my... Thank you, Councillor Thurlby. Councillor Maureen Martin. Yes, I think all of those areas that you've just talked about were actually in the red wall seats, which are hoping to gain again in the next election. And certainly, were, that's why they're being bribed with all of the money, so that they can keep those seats. Not in areas where we've got Labour-controlled areas. We're not getting anything, and that's what the idea is. So if you could just think about that instead of 
you know, you're not that naive as to know what's not going on in the political realm. Councillor Bones. Thank you, Chair. It's nice to see Councillor Madden coming to the defence of the Labour Party. That's just kicked her out. Um, Councillor Johnson clearly illustrated... Uh, however, Councillor Bones. It's true, Chair. Councillor Bones, just keep it orderly, please. Councillor Johnson has clearly illustrated the, how, that how having an effective mayor and cabinet working with government can deliver more funding. Now, it's a shame we don't have it in North Tyneside, obviously. But what we do have is a mayor in the Tees Valley delivering a lot more funding for Teesside. We have a mayor in Manchester delivering more funding for Manchester, a Labour mayor, an effective Labour mayor. But we don't have an effective mayor here. So should the mayor not look at her own side before, before writing to government down, with yet more begging lists? Thank you. Councillor Deer. Thank you. I think we can see a theme developing here. I think it's very sad to see that Councillor Bartoli and Councillor Johnson, councillors for Tynemouth, a couple of weeks ago voted against the regeneration plans for North Shields, and tonight they're voting against levelling up. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think it's a bit of a shame that Councillor Johnson, um, even though you give all these facts and figures, uh, really is made a through against uh, not so much politicians, but against the officers who work, our two executive and officers in regeneration, who um, I'm sure the Mayor can mention at some point, but how many jobs we've brought into the borough since just being the Mayor, and uh, how hard they work. So the way he sounds that, we may be, he may think we're useless, but surely God, uh, our officers work night and day for this borough and for our people, so I would maybe re refrain your remarks next time or retract that. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Bartoli. Uh, I would just remind uh, Councillor Day, who I believe is also a Tynemouth councillor, um, that she also voted uh, down the proposals for the spending on uh, North Shields because they were also in our budget. So Semantic down, quibbling, as was pointed out at the time. Down, I think if you down. go back to the Go minister, Excuse me, Jay, you can't talk about each exactly other. what happened. Thank you very much. Like the mayor. Uh, just point of order again about jobs. I just was at a meeting the other day with some businesses in the New Glasgow. Chair, what part Chair, of the Constitution what, what is the, part the Constitution referring to? Is she referring to? If it's a point of order, right, it's, not, okay. it's not a mechanism of rebuttal. Well, perhaps I can comment then. Can I comment, Chair? Yeah. Right. I was at a meeting the other day with some businesses and some officers, and I was told that. The Quorum Business Park in North Tyneside is full. Jobs are actually, people are, businesses are rushing into there. So much so that they're looking for space to build more, more places to, for businesses who want to come to North Tyneside. Over the years we've been in power, you would look back at the figures, we have brought in over 12,000 jobs and 8,000 apprenticeships in North Tyneside. And at the end of the day, I don't care particularly whether Councillor Bourne thinks I'm a rotten mayor or a hopeless mayor. The people of North Tyneside actually think we're not too bad in this administration. We're going to move on now to the move of the motion, exercise right of reply. I think it's probably going to be 2-2, two -two, isn't it, on the scores tonight from the point of view unanimous and not unanimous. <coughs> the Department for Local Government and Communities, its definition is very clear on its website in that it assumed a 3% council tax rise this year for core spending power. When you talk about the 4.5% increase in total funding, a vast majority of that was the actual council tax rise. I hate to tell you that, but it actually was. From the point of view of Councillor Chris Johnson, Councillor Bones, the list of stuff that you've shouted out there, the capital spend, it's not actually revenue, it's not, it's not CSP anyway. You've attacked fully funded cultural offerings in the borough, you've attacked road improvements in the borough, you've attacked and road against regeneration plans in the borough. All of that is actually separate to the core spend and power calculation. Again, that's not something which actually goes to that calculation in the first place. I find really quite worrying from the point of view of Councillor Wallace. She was actually in this position for four years. She doesn't understand the cumulative impact 
of a vote in the council chamber and the budgets you put forward in the past. Well, what I did was last week, sorry, last month after the budget debate, I actually handed everyone a piece of paper, or Councillor Johnson did, which showed the impact on the council finances if we had voted through your budget last year, and it would have been absolutely catastrophic. As well as the savings we had to make, we would have had to make another £5.2 million savings. We would have been closing, closing ledger centres, closing libraries, closing customer first centres because of that additional black hole. You talk about a balanced budget last, uh, last month. The only reason you balanced your budget was because you sold our airport. So I'll come back again to how CSP actually works. If we received the same as Durham, we would have an extra £1.5 million this year. If it was the same as Northumberland, it would be £11.2 million. Sunderland, 14.3, Newcastle, 16.9, South Tyneside, 26.4, Gateshead, 26.8. I can go on. I won't. Why should North Tyneside be shortchanged by Boris Johnson? And I ask anyone who will not support this in the chamber tonight, why are you more, you more interested in representing Boris Johnson in North Tyneside than representing our residents and our residents' interests? You voted for the national insurance rise, which took up to £1,000 out of residents' pockets. You voted for the universal credit cut, which took up to £1,200 out of residents' pockets. Funding North Tyneside properly would allow us to deliver a range of programmes to ease the cost of living crisis in the borough. We live in a remarkable place. We should receive at least the average funding settlement for councils in North Tyneside. I urge all members in this chamber to support the motion and to stop shortchanging our borough. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Can we now move to the vote? Yeah, Councillor Linda Oakley. Yes. Councillor Lewis Bartoli. Yes. Councillor Gary Bell. Four. Councillor Linda Bell. Four. Councillor Liam Bones. Again. Councillor Trish Brady. Four. Councillor Sean Brockbank. Against. Councillor Brian Burdis. Four. Councillor Carol Burdis. Four. Councillor Joanne Cassidy. Councillor Karen Clark. Four. Councillor Debbie Cox. Four. Councillor Stephen Cox. Four. Councillor Naomi Craven. Four. Councillor Julie Crudis. Councillor Eddie Dark. Councillor Linda Dark. Councillor Sarah Day. Councillor David Drummond. Councillor Peter Early. Councillor Sandra Graham. Councillor Muriel Green. Four. Councillor Margaret Hall. Four. Councillor Tracy Hallway. Four. Councillor John Harrison. Four. Councillor Janet Hunter. Four. Councillor John Hunter. Four. Councillor Carl Johnson. Four. Councillor Hannah Johnson. Four. Councillor Christopher Johnston. Yes. Councillor Joe Kerwin. Four. Councillor Wendy Lott. Four. Councillor Gary Madden. Four. Councillor Maureen Madden. Four. Councillor Pamela McIntyre. Yes. Councillor Anthony McMullen. Four. Councillor Janice Moore. Councillor Jim Montague. Four. Councillor Thomas Mulvenna. Councillor Andy Newman. Councillor Pat Oliver. Councillor John O'Shea. Councillor Norman Percy. Councillor Stephen Phillips. Four. Councillor Bruce Pickard. Four. Councillor Martin Rankin. Four. Norma Redfern, elected mayor. Four. Councillor Paul Richardson. Four. Councillor Willie Samuel. Four. Councillor Jane Shaw. Four. Councillor Matthew Thurloway. Four. Councillor Joan Walker. Four. Councillor Judith Wallace. Yes. Councillor George Westwater. Councillor Matt Wilson, uh, Councillor John Sterling. It's not, it's not yet. I think. Forty-six. Forty-six. Four. Forty-six. Four. 
in here to get us. Motion is carried. 46 votes for and 4 in 8 against. Motion number 4. Can I invite Councillor Matthew Thurlby to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. I think Councillor Arant is going to be disappointed with the score tonight. Chair, anyone who uses public transport on a regular basis will have seen the marked decline in our public transport system since 2010. Public transport has now suffered more than a decade of austerity, as bus funding in, in England has been cut by more than 40%. This has resulted in a loss or reduction of more than 3,000 bus services in England. The pandemic has only served to exacerbate the problems caused by austerity. Unfortunately, the situation is only going to get worse for the residents of North Tyneside from next month. While North Tyneside Council has stepped up and put an additional £750,000 into local bus routes and services, this won't be enough to plug the financial black hole caused by austerity and the pandemic. If the councillors opposite care about bus services, as they claimed at our last meeting, they'll all support this. They'll all support our demand for more money for public transport. We hear so much from the government about levelling up and the levelling up agenda. They even renamed the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government to prove this. But how can they be serious when people in the North East will struggle to get to work? And how can the government be serious about cl the climate crisis when they are making it harder for people to use public transport? How can they be serious about tackling wealth inequality when cuts to public transport impact those less well off the hardest? Leveling up is another big society. Anyone remember that? Leveling up is another northern powerhouse. Leveling up is just another false promise. People in the North East are sick of false promises from conservative politicians in London. At what point do we say enough? When the lack of proper funding prevents people being able to get to work, when the lack of proper funding prevents people attending doctor's appointments, when the lack of proper funding prevents children and young people getting to school, when the lack of proper funding prevents people doing their food shopping. People in, no in the North East have had enough of hollow slogans and sound bites. We need more money for local communities and local services. Instead, we have a public transport system that's ready to break down. In the South, the government is building a multi-billion pound high-speed railway la line between London and Birmingham, as we speak. It can travel 225 miles an hour. The people in my ward in Walls End will struggle to get, to a get, will struggle to get a bus to North Shields. I'm going to say please support this motion, but I assume I'm talking to the councillors on this side of the room. Thank you, Councillor Thurlby. Councillor Graham, do you wish to take the motion? I do, thank you. It is intrinsically unfair that in a poor region economically, like ours, we are so far behind in transport funding. £877 received by Transport for London to our £314 per person in this area on public transport. This stifles economic regeneration impedes the huge challenge of climate change and the modal shift from cars to public transport, as it is sometimes cheaper for families to take the car than to use public transport, even with high petrol and diesel costs. <coughs> that cannot be right. <coughs> Air quality, integrated ticketing, and expansion of our metro is part of our Transport for the North plans. This is all under threat. This exacerbates inequalities, stops people getting to work at a time they need to be there, particularly for shift work and antisocial hours, and stops our so-called levelling up, something this region desperately needs to be able to be successful to grow and to give us a cleaner and a greener borough. 
I second this motion and hope for everyone's support. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Can I now invite members to speak the motion? Okay. Councillor Hockley. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I can't support this motion because bullet point five states that the Conservative Government has continued to ignore the North East on transport, which is not correct. This Conservative Government is spending £166 million on uh, reinstating the railway line between Ashington and Newcastle for passengers uh, for services, which will benefit the residents of all the area, uh, for obviously Ashington, Bedlington and surrounding areas, making the journeys into Newcastle quicker and reduce the carbon footprint by removing cars from the roads, as, uh, as we see on the A19. The Government have or has already signed off £34 million for the preliminary surveys and upgrading requirements. The Conservative Government is spending £337 million to assist Nexus to, re to renew all the, the uh, trains with modern uh, state-of-the-art metro trams and replace the aged stocks of rail vehicles. This will benefit the, the residents of North Tyneside by making a more reliable and comfortable service. Through the Transforming City Fund of £208 million, the Government has allocated £98 million on improving the capacity of the metro line between Jarrow and Hebben, and this will create a better and more regular ser uh, service between South Shears and Newcastle. This shows that the Conservative Government is spending large amounts of money improving the railway and metro infrastructure to make public transport better and more reliable. Some of the comments refer to about hospitals not having buses. Well, that's been going on for quite some time, as many of you would know my view about that. Um, even to this day, we have people who go up to Cromlington Hospital, can't get there, have to pay £25 to get a taxi, um, and yet, you know, same thing back. And this was a major issue that we had when the hospital was being looked at to be built. It's quite interesting. I attended a meeting last night of the council to talk about uh, changes and transport and things. So lot, lots of good things from that. Uh, and comments such as everybody wants to drive. Regardless of whether we have metros and buses, we still have an issue. Trying to just say it's up to the government when you look at the north east versus if, because that's the impression I get from all of this being put forward. In London, I worked, and like many of you here, uh, and uh, you know, to you travelled either by bus or on the met on on the uh, system. And uh, I'm afraid we may be, as we were talking about last night, is to change people's attitude about how to try and get people to use more buses and um, the metros rather than the main lines, buses, uh, uh, cars, or what have you. Um, but the upshot of all of this is the government are still giving us quite a quantity of money. Thank you. Councillor Anthony McMullen. Thank you. Um, it's it's a, sort of a rigged deck, this, if you think about it. So we've had the accolades of uh, the Mayor of Manchester mentioned before, who's just managed to you know, insource in all the buses and charge £2 for fares on the buses. Uh, TfL has always been able to control their buses. Something that we've wanted to do ourselves, and I remember being in Economic Prosperity um, Committee a couple of years ago going, yeah, we could bring the, house, the, the, cars, the buses back in-house, in re, re, um, you know, nationalise the buses on a local level, as it were. And, yeah, th that sort of thing, we would have more control. We'd possibly not even need as much money because we'd be able to put the money where it should be. So 
it's just such a rigged hand of having you know this there of metro services which uh, Wheat Slate's so proudly served by, um, and all the improvements to that. Just looking at the Arriva bus app before I left today, so yes, there's a 43 bus service going from Newcastle all the way into um, Seaton Burn and Dudley, uh, of which three of the services are cancelled and have been proactively cancelled. What do we have as a council to say that's a bad thing? Nothing. We can just send them a nice little letter. Um, we can't do anything about it. We have no control. But if the deck wasn't as rigged, if we were afforded the same powers as, we, as Andy gets in uh, Manchester or TfL gets, you know, there's so many things we could do, which I was thinks to item five there, which is continue to ignore the North East. Okay, a bus operator might lose a couple of percent in profit, but what for what? For us having a holistic, integrated transport system where people can get from Crampton Hospital to the place that they live in, in wide open, or go to the airport for work at a reasonable time, or have the connected services together. You know, it's just a rigged hand, it's a rigged deck which it needs a proper looking at, and it shouldn't be the politics of you have the wrong shape of mayoral patch, which is the reason we get blocked. I sit there on the audit committee of the T uh, Integrated Transport Authority, and they sit there and say, we're blocked from getting funding, we're blocked from being able to have these negotiations because we have the wrong shaped mayoral patch. So it's a political thing that's going on here. It's you know, great we should have the same amount of money as London, that seems fair. But actually just having the same rights and privileges as those other authorities is where we're missing. So that's not in this motion, but it should be. Thank you, Chair. Let me start by saying this motion should not have been allowed as it's dishonest. Mayor Redfern recently talked in this chamber about honesty and integrity, and the wording of this motion is a perfect example of the Labour Party's dishonesty and their contempt for residents of North Tyneside. It states that, quote, Labour in North Tyneside recently voted through a budget which increased funding to Nexus, allowing them to save local bus routes, while the Conservatives voted against. Now, Councillor Thurloway knows fine well that this is cheap politics for leaflet headlines. The Conservative budget. The Conservative budget actually included. The Conservative budget actually included more money to save local bus services. That's money on top of what Labour set aside. I think you'll find that it was him and his party that voted against more funding for our buses, not the other way around. On the substantive point, this motion deliberately blurs the lines. Many parts of the North East are rural, and this is not the case in London. The government has invested heavily in public transport, like the millions being spent in the reopening of the Blythe and Ashington line, which will boost our economy here in North Tyneside. Perhaps if the council started to spend wisely again, like not splashing out £1.5 million on a widely unpopular Dutch star roundabout, or tens of thousands of pounds on morphs, then the council would be Point able to invest chair, more... the chair, that funding comes from central government. Which part of the constitution is Councillor Rankin referring to, sorry? That's not a point of order, Chair. Um, or tens of thousands of pounds on morphs, then we as a council will be able to invest more money in our public transport, but under this mayor that seems unlikely. As ever, Labour are well rehearsed in crying to government, whilst not taking any action that they are able to. This Conservative government is already spending hundreds of millions of pounds investing in metro services. It took an online data harvesting bus survey to get this Labour group to even consider it. Meanwhile, Conservative run Northumberland County Council is pushing ahead with huge rail improvements. That's what the Conservatives deliver. Action, not just words. I won't be supporting this motion. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Cox. Thank you, Chair. Uh, once again, Chair, we, we see the same, the same arguments. Again, we're simply asking that this area gets the same funding as other areas. Councillor Arkley made some points regarding the, the Northumberland Line train and South Tyneside metros, pointing out that they're, they're, they're very beneficial to both the environment, the public, and things like that. There isn't, we're not asking them not to fund those. We're simply saying it can be wider. Councillor Thurloway, uh, Councillor uh, McMullen mentioned about we've been asking for many years for, to get some sort of control over the bus services, to go back to a point when we used to have an integrated transport service bringing the buses in. It was very effective, very cheap, and we're talking about now the environmental damage that all these cars do. Um, and when we could solve it, a lot of it, 
by simply bringing some control back to local government for, for the transport system. I don't understand, again, all we're asking for is the same funding as, other, as another part of the country. We've all, we've all been to London, we've all been there, we've seen how effective it is. It moves millions of people every day, and, it's like, and we can do that, and we do it now with the Metro, but we can do it even better if we had the extra funding and the same funding as other parts of the country. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of points initially on Councillor Bones' fundamental misunderstanding of how the Council budget works. The Labour Group or the uh, ruling administration proposed a budget. That is the budget all the way through. The Conservative Group gets the opportunity to propose objections. They propose an objection, the Labour Group votes against it. The, the substantive budget is still what the Labour Party Group proposed because we propose that and that continues to the next step. What happens then is then you all vote on that motion. So voting it, Matthew Council Fellow's motion is absolutely factually correct that the Conservatives voted against our budget was to increase funding by two million pounds to Nexus. You did. You'd be, you'd be quite, you should be quite clear on that. But fundamental misunderstanding of how that works. I want to talk about the Nefumland line, which both Council Bones and Arkley have referenced as a great thing. It is a fantastic thing. We've worked with the combined authority, Mayor Redfern, Mayor Driscoll. Um, we've worked with former... I have to remember, the Northumberland line came to life when, prior to the Conservatives being in administration in Northumberland. It was then the then Labour leader of the County Council that brought the scheme forward. You talk about £166 million funding for the Northumberland line. The reality, as we sit right now, is that £34 million has been signed off for it. The rest of the funding has still not been signed off. To this day, still waiting. I really, really hope that that gets signed off because that will allow massive opportunities for residents in North Tyneside, people are commuting to North Tyneside from the, the area, because we're going to have a first natural rail station at Northumberland Park in North Tyneside. The Northumberland line is a good thing, but it, factually, of the 166 million, only 34 million has currently been signed off. When we'll talking about Councillor Arkley listed, a number of things that are fantastic for the North East and are government funded. But still, Councillor Arkley, £877 per person in London, £314 for the North East. There's still a massive gap between what we, whether we, those are fantastic things that you mentioned, there's a massive gap between what we get and what we actually deserve. In terms of what we deserve, right now, as we speak, there's a £650 million pot for the North East called the City Region Sustainable Transport Fund. We can't currently access that. We've asked the government if we can access it. They said, no, go away and get a mayoral combined authority. So they're telling us that there's £650 million there, but we have to have a mayoral combined authority first. Who's that mayoral combined authority being held up by? Lots of people, certainly not the residents of North Tyneside, who are suffering from that. But also in terms of the government are now backtracking on the £650 million it was £650 million funding. That was for whatever the default administration wanted to spend on. Now we've been told, well, actually, it's got to cover metro capital improvements, which will amount to hundreds of millions of pounds over the next couple of years. It's also got to include what you want to spend on roads and pavements and potholes locally. So, again, devolving responsibility for something that should be central government responsibility to local leaders. We'd almost have nothing left of that £650 million if the Conservatives keep chipping away at it. The only way we will ever get to a situation like Manchester, as Councillor McMullins just said, is if we can spend some of that money on setting up a franchise system. If the Conservatives keep chipping away at our, at our services before we get anywhere near that £650 million pot, we've got absolutely no chance. In the Manchester devolution deal, it had £65 million for setting up a franchise alone. Andy Burnham had to get a 2% council tax precept on all the residents in, in Manchester to achieve that because he has the powers to do so. We don't have the powers to impact transport in the North East like we'd wish to. On bus funding, the bus funding, I can't believe the, the Conservative benches haven't mentioned it yet. The, the government have put 150 minute, million... Johnson. The government put £150 million on the bus funding recently. Um, but that is too little, too late for the residents of North Tyneside who have now have bus cuts baked in. We asked for months and months and months beforehand, extend 
the bus recovery grant, and at the twelfth hour, when cuts are already baked in the North Tyneside, the government ride in and will force residents of North Tyneside to not have buses to where they need to go. The K1 cut, sorry, the K2 cut, the Q3 servers cut, connectivity around Walls End and North Shields cut, services around Whitley Bay cut. Ability to get them to Cromarton Hospital even further cut. Had we had that funding come earlier, we still haven't even told how much we're going to get, frankly, but had that come earlier, that might have given us the chance to save some of those services. Instead, it was relying on the extra £2 million that this Labour Party put in in its budget that the Conservatives voted against to save those services. We have saved services in colour codes. We saved the service 1A, which Willie, Councillor Willie Samuel campaigned Thank a lot God, on. Johnson. In Time Out Ward, we saved service 11, which Sarah Day campaigned a lot on. And among Seaton South Ward, we saved a number of services 57A, which Councillor Drummond has campaigned, campaigned on. Seated. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Carl Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I will be supporting this motion. I think good quality, affordable public transport is absolutely essential for everyone in North Tyneside, but it's particularly important in tackling inequalities. Without a good quality public transport system, we're limiting people's life chances, their options, their choices. It adds to what's known as the poverty premium, where we have poorer people paying more for goods and services, if you can't travel to access cheaper goods from larger supermarkets, etc., then you're forced to pay premium prices. It may also exclude people from job opportunities if you can't travel to work. So all round, basically not to have a good quality, affordable system is penalising everyone in North Tyneside, but particularly our poorest people. And I think it's yet another example of how the Conservative government is actually penalising people who are already disadvantaged. It's deepening that disadvantage, and I find it, again, you know, it's all talked about in the context of levelling up, and it's not levelling up if we can't even agree a motion of this nature in this chamber tonight, then, again, I, I'm just flabbergasted that the Tory councillors can't back this motion. It's about supporting all our residents in the borough, but it would particularly be important to those people who are most disadvantaged. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. I think I will support it, too, as you could imagine. There are people in this borough who can't go anywhere after 5 o'clock. Some of the elderly people complain to me bitterly at the weekend. They don't, can't see their relatives because they can't get a bus, to be quite honest. And those are the people that we care about, as you know. But I'd also like, Chair, to put a few facts of the truth out. Um, at the beginning of the Northumberland line, it was the Labour, Labour administration that put the idea forward. When the, when the business case had to be uh, brought about, it was the three Labour leaders that put the money in from the Combined Authority for the business case for the Northumberland Line. And since then, the two Labour leaders have worked with the, with the leader of the Conservative leader of the Northumberland uh, County Council, who is a gentleman, who has got integrity, and we can work with him. And at the end of the day, if one doesn't understand the meaning of intent, integrity and honesty, you should look at up, Councillor Bones. Councillor Rankin. Thank you, Chair. What's just been said, opposite, is that if we don't spend money on a specific road improvement transport scheme or children's cultural project, we can spend more money on transport. That is fundamentally misleading. If you are saying that you would take that money and you would spend it on transport, or you would tell officers to do so, you are telling them to act illegally. That is a simple fact. If you are saying that you would not deliver those schemes and you would send the money back, it would not create another penny for transport in the borough. So if you're going to start telling residents that, you are, you are speaking, you, I'm going to say it, you're lying, because you've been told time and time again about how this works. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Can I now invite... Move of the motion. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Bartoli. Thank you, Chair. 
with regards to what, what we've heard this evening, and I'm sure as the, this evening is going to progress in, in much the same way, um, Councillor Cox twice now, Mr. Councillor Newman and others have uh, decried the, um, the fact that we're not supporting these motions and how heartless Tories don't want the best for North Tyneside residents. And I just wonder who they think they're speaking to and who they're trying to kid. Because everyone on that side of the chamber knows that these motions are written in such a way as to make them impossible for us to support, as we know. Um, so whilst I am enjoying the acting and the full indignation from that side, can I suggest that if you genuinely want to work constructively to ask for more money or more funding or advice, that we do that in a cross-party manner, because this play-acting of indignation when you've set motions up that we can't support, I'm afraid, is becoming embarrassing. Thank you, Councillor Bartoli. Can I invite them over the motion to ex exercise the right to reply? Thank you, Chair. I think Councillor Bartoli has thrown the, the gauntlet down, and I think I throw it back to him and say, will you write to the Prime Minister and ask for a dramatic increase in public transport spending in the North East? You wrote to the Prime Minister asking him to consider his position when he was in political trouble, which would affect that group of councillors. Yeah. Will you write to him now and ask for more funding for the residents of North Tyneside? I'm throwing the gauntlet down. You don't have to respond now. Back to the debate. <laughs> Firstly, I won't take lectures from Councillor Bones about honesty in politics. Secondly, um, the councillors... Point of order, Chair, that's the third Labour member that's called me dishonest or a liar. I didn't call that's you dishonest. Outrageous. I didn't call you dishonest. I said I wouldn't <laughs> take lectures from you about, dis about honesty. It's different. Um, thirdly, um, the councillors seem to be avoiding talking about bus services and rather talking about um, the metro system. How long did we wait for this fleet of metros? Years and years and years. I remember even before I became a councillor, there was campaigns to get people um, to, to get people to sign up to actually try and get the government to spend money and get a new fleet. You know, yes, they did, but it took metros literally creaking along to get the government to invest in the metro system. At what point will it take the government to invest in the bus services in the North East? That's the real question. That, that's the real question that will have consequences for the residents of North Tyneside. And I also propose that it's a named vote, Chair. Do you have a second there? A second Can we now move on to the vote? Councillor Linda Oakley, Councillor Lewis Bartoli, Councillor Gary Bell, Councillor Linda Bell, Councillor Liam Bones, Councillor Trish Brady, Councillor Sean Brockbank, Councillor Brian Burdis, Councillor Carol Burdis, Councillor Karen Clark, Councillor Debbie Cox, Councillor Stephen Cox, Councillor Naomi Craven, Councillor Julie Crudis, Councillor Eddie Dark, Councillor Linda Dark, Councillor Sarah Day, Councillor David Drummond, Councillor Peter Early, Councillor Sandra Graham, Councillor Muriel Green, Councillor Margaret Hall, Councillor Tracy Hallway, Councillor John Harrison, Councillor Janet Hunter, Councillor John Hunter, Four. Councillor Carl Johnson, Four. Councillor Hannah Johnson, Four. Councillor Christopher Johnston, Four. Councillor Joe Kerwin, Four. Councillor Wendy Lott, Four. Councillor Gary Madden, Four. Councillor Maureen Madden, Four. Councillor Pamela McIntyre, yes. Councillor Anthony McMullen, Four. Councillor Janice Moore, Four. Councillor Jim Montague, Councillor Thomas Mulvenna, Councillor Andy Newman, Councillor Pat Oliver, Councillor John O'Shea, Councillor Norman Percy, Councillor Stephen Phillips, Councillor Bruce Pickard, 
Councillor Martin Rankin. Oh. Norma Redfern, elected Mayor. Oh. Councillor Paul Richardson. Oh. Councillor Willie Samuel. Oh. Councillor Jane Shaw. Oh. Councillor Matthew Thirlway. Oh. Councillor Joan Walker. Oh. Councillor Judith Wallace. Yes. Councillor George Westwater. Yes. And Councillor Matt Wilson. Motion is carried, 46-4 and 8 against. We move on to motion number 5. I can I invite Councillor Andy Newman to speak to the motion, please? Do I move it? Thank you, Chair. I'm, uh, I'm hoping we can once again show solidarity across the chamber due to the, uh, the, the subject matter in front of us. So I live in hope. Um, I ultimately believe we as a nation have a, a long and proud history of welcoming people from around the world, especially from the Commonwealth, which is why a number of items in the Nationalities and Borders Bill have caused uh, concern. Uh, Praxis, which is a charity that specialises in supporting migrants and refugees, has summarised the concern by stating that several legal opinions and much evidence has already been published that highlights the way in which the bill goes against the UK's obligation under the Refugee Convention. Also during the debate on the Nationality and Borders Bill, the question of visa fees for Commonwealth veterans was once again highlighted via the Mercer's Jarvis Amendment. So if I could start with Clause 11. Now, according to practice again, Clause 11 would see asylum seekers who come to Britain via unauthorised routes blocked from receiving full refugee rights in the UK, regardless of how strong their claim is. Now, ultimately, I believe that people who seek asylum should have their case heard not on the basis of their method of travel, but purely on the merits of their application. Essentially, those who seek the protection of this country should be granted that protection based completely and solely on their need. This bill will essentially create two tiers of refugees. Group 1, who come on a government-sponsored scheme, would receive full rights. Group 2, would have, who, was, sorry, who would have arrived by irregular routes, would have diminished rights, such as the need to reapply every 30 months and wait up to 10 years before a permanent right to remain can be granted. It's also been implied that Clause 11 will deny Group 2 refugees access from any type of safety net during the 10-year period up until they uh, obtain a permanent right to remain in the UK. Now, refugees who arrive in the UK are often destitute, and the policy which in effect renders them unable to access any type of safety net will intensify this hardship and result in unaccepted levels of poverty and potentially exploitation. Now, there has been a lot of criticism uh, of Clause 11, and some of them have come from the Conservative Party themselves, with uh, MPs David Davies and Dominic Grieve writing to Boris Johnson to say that the policy was dangerous and in their opinion would significantly breach key international obligations. And I think it's also important to note that the House of Lords voted to delete this clause by 204 votes to 126. And I think it's only proper to quote Envor Solomon, the CEO of the Refugee Council, who said that the vote uh, was a victory for compassion, humanity and the rights of refugees, and that the House of Lords is standing up for those in need of protection regardless of how they arrived at our shores, and I think he's right. In regards to Commonwealth veterans' visa fees, I'm going to quickly remind us, as there are members who weren't present then, of what the issues are. So under this government, Commonwealth veterans have been forced to pay just under 2005 per person to remain in the UK, with a family of four needing to pay just under £10,000. Now, a number of people and organisations, including Citizenship for Soldiers, have campaigned to remove these fees. And I'm also proud to say that a number of labour groups across the country successfully brought motions to their respective councils calling on these visa fees to be removed, of which this council was one of the first in the country. And I think we should be proud of that. Um, now, during the debate on the Nationalities and Borders Bill, Dan Jarvis of the Labour Party and Johnny Mercer of the Conservative Party proposed an amendment that would remove all these fees for Commonwealth veterans and their families. However, the government whipped its MPs to vote this amendment down. Now, very recently, the government has announced it would finally bow to pressure and it would remove the visa fees for veterans who have served six years. 
However, it has refused to remove the fees for the spouses and children of Commonwealth veterans. Now, I know as someone who served in a conflict zone that I would never have been able to undertake these tours of duties without the support of my wife and the love of my children. The spouses of our service personnel are the bedrock that they rely on, and to treat the sacrifices of Commonwealth veterans, spouses and children with so little regard is simply immoral. One and minute, I will Carlson, you woman. One minute. Sorry, I'll, I'll summarise now. I'll, I'll remind the group opposite that the last time that a motion regarding Commonwealth veterans' visa fees came to this chamber, they refused to vote in favour of that motion, and I hope that won't be repeated tonight. I will simply end by saying that, ultimately, this motion is about morality, humanity and compassion. So I hope everybody in this chamber will have reason to vote in favour of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Councillor Dear, do you wish to second the motion? Uh, I do, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm proud to support this motion. North Tyneside has a proud tradition of welcoming those seeking asylum, and as we have heard in the earlier motion, we as a council are committed to providing shelter and safety to those who need our help and support. I would also like to thank Penny Henry and everyone involved with Time Mouth Together with Refugees for their work in drawing attention to these important issues. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has put sharply into focus the government's Nationality and Borders Bill, which is due back in the House of Commons next week. Ahead of that, I believe it is important that we as a council make our views known to the government. The bill fails to deal with the fundamental issues in our asylum system. It proposes unworkable solutions that will cost the taxpayer and it undermines international humanitarian conventions at a time when cooperation is needed now more than ever. The government claims the bill will mean pushbacks at sea, even though border force officials have said it is dangerous and unworkable. The government claims the bill will mean offshore processing, even though no country has agreed and the cost to the taxpayer is huge. It claims the bill will fix the asylum system, even though it will add even longer delays to asylum cases being assessed. And it claims the bill will stop trafficking gangs, even though it reduces protections for modern slavery and trafficking victims. The heartbreaking situa situation in Ukraine has caused a refugee crisis, and it's also brought home the importance of supporting refugees, whatever area of conflict they come from and however they arrive. Although I welcome that the government is now, albeit belatedly, taking action to provide routes of sanctuary for those fleeing Ukraine, the bill as it stands is cruel and unworkable, and I think it's only right that we as a council call on the government to rethink the bill. I'll be supporting this motion, and I hope the opposition can do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dick. Can I now invite members to speak the motion? Councillor Westwater. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, there are three points in this motion. The Conservative group certainly approve and agree with point B, as legislation always constantly under review. And we also support point C, but we cannot support point A. This country has a proud record helping those fleeing persecution, oppression and tyranny from around the world alongside providing 10 billion a year to support people through overseas aid, this country is a global leader in refugee resettlement. The purpose of the power to differentiate being introduced through the Nationality and Borders Bill is to influence the choices that migrants may make when leaving their country of origin, seeking to encourage them to claim asylum in the first safe country they reach and discourage them from travelling to the UK by means of a dangerous journeys and instead use safe and legal routes. I would like to reassure the group opposite that the proposals in the bill fully comply with the UK's global obligations introducing commitments to the European Convention on Human Rights and the United Nations Refugee Convention. I am sure that you are aware, through the Bill, whether people enter the UK legally or illegally may also have an impact on how their asylum claim progresses, and their status in the UK if that claim is successful. After looking further into this, the United Nations Refugee Convention does allow 
for different treatment where, for example, refugees have not come directly from a country of persecution. For example, if someone enters the UK via a safe country where they could have claimed asylum, they are not seeking refugee, re sorry, refuge from imminent peril. Therefore, returning them to a safe third country is not inconsistent with the UN Refugee Convention. Under Clause 11, therefore, those who meet the terms of the Refugee Convention will be granted refugee status. This is no question of the clause making it harder to be a refugee or otherwise enabling the government to refuse refugee protection to those who need it. This is simply not true. What the clause does enable the Secretary of State to distinguish between refugees based on whether they came directly and claimed without delay, but anyone considered under this policy will be a refugee. And due to Part A in the motion, we cannot support and therefore be voting against the proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Westwell. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I'm not going to go into the politics of this motion at all, but I'm astounded to what Councillor Westwater just said. We just passed a motion earlier by declaring our complete solidarity with the people of Ukraine and our willingness to take refugees from Ukraine. No one is flying out of Ukraine at the moment, Councillor Westwater, and therefore cannot fly directly to the United Kingdom. Therefore, of what you've just said there, no Ukrainian refugee could come to the United Kingdom because they will all have passed through a safe country. I'm utterly astonished with the hypocrisy in the shown there in terms of recognising that and not recognising that chair. Um, we also, oh, I was fully support this motion, but I couldn't understand. I don't know if Councillor West realised what he said there, but what he's saying there, no Ukrainian refugees could make it to this country. Are you saying there's two classes of refugees, Councillor Westwater? Because under what you said, every Ukrainian refugee that's leaving the country at the moment is leaving mainly via the Romanian and Polish borders. Those people are going to a safe country and therefore, under your rules, would not come to the United Kingdom. I would absolutely welcome those people and you said you would just an hour and a half ago. Bizarre, Chair. I fully support this motion. Councillor Thurlow Basically, Councillor Johnson took the words out of my mouth. Um, I'm just thinking about the, the refugees in Poland. There's more than a million refugees in Poland. Is that fair on Poland? We're supposed to be a continent of friendly nations. And we're abandoning those people in Poland. We're, we're basically saying it's, you know, to the Polish government, you look after them because they fled into your country. You're safe. You can look after them. And I think that's really, from a foreign, foreign relations point of view, it's very, very irresponsible. Thank you, Councillor Thurley, Councillor Rankin. Chair, I would echo all of that in, in the spirit of what Councillor Bortoli said before. This is not political in the slightest. It's not intended to catch anyone out. But you can't have voted for that previous motion and then vote against this one on the basis of, of paragraph A because that literally means that the only people that can come to the country from Ukraine are people who take off on a plane and don't actually land anywhere else other than the UK. Councillor Sandra Graham. This troubles me greatly. It's as if we have, Councillor Westwater, the deserving and the undeserving refugee. And that really concerns me. I would like you to uh, in maybe uh, enlarge that and see where we go on that. Councillor Bartoli. I think from the comments opposite, I think you've completely misrepresented what Councillor Westwater was saying. We have said we would support the bill, but we're not comfortable with the removal of Clause 11. And Clause 11 is just about whether or not the, the refugee comes through legal or illegal routes. So what we, were, we are not at all saying that we would not uh, welcome Ukrainian refugees who came via a third country. What we were saying is that, um, as, that all those who come through the legal routes will receive the same treatment, whereas those who are, come through illegal routes will receive a different treatment. But the purpose of that is very clear. The purpose of that is to try and shut down these illegal routes 
where thousands of migrants are dying. It's not meant to punish anybody. It's meant to try and close these routes down. So I, th I, think, uh, I think it's unfair to, to uh, class Councillor Westwater's uh, comments as somehow saying that we weren't welcoming refugees. I think that's very disingenuous. Great point in personal explanation, which is in the Constitution, as per the rules 7F. Um, what Councillor Bartoli said is fully... We are not suggesting that it's to do with point A. We are suggesting was what Councillor Westwater said in his speech, that he said that refugees should settle in their first safe country. He did say that. And therefore, any Ukrainian refugee leaving Ukraine will get to a safe country before they get to the United Kingdom because there's no flights out. That is what we are basing what we've said on, and also, as opposed to point A, Chair. Anybody else like to speak the motion? Councillor Council. 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 Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think Clause 11 is an attempt by the, uh, the current government to stop people on boats coming from France because France is a safe country and stop the, um, the exploitation of people trying to get to the UK. And I think that's what Clause 11 means. But I, you know, you're still going to have uh, major problems with Clause 11 because if any of us in this chamber went home tonight and then decided that we couldn't live in this country anymore and we would leave with just a bag of clothes and maybe some money and a passport or, or, or a very few belongings to leave our families and then risk going across the English Channel on a boat. I don't think that uh, you're doing it because you want uh, your fancy job as a bricklayer or something in this country and get a free house. I think you must be uh, desperate, you must be a refugee, you must be um, somebody who's seeking persecution maybe for religious reasons, from war. And uh, I couldn't imagine um, anyone leaving, telling me to leave my family tonight and possibly never see them again and uh, possibly, you know, dying in the English Channel. So I just think we have to show some humanity to each other. And uh, the, the bill is intended for that. It's uh, Pretty Mattel's bill, which is getting a lot of opposition as well on Clause 11. Um, and on the on C, which Andy spoke about, uh, the Commonwealth Veterans. You know, Commonwealth Veterans, uh, they have changed it. And Johnny Mercer uh, is a Conservative MP, if people don't know, from Plymouth. Speaks well on veterans, a good, a good man, and uh, Dan Jarvis from Barnsley, ex para. Um, if you serve in the military, your family is key. Keeps you safe, keeps you grounded, and if they've got, a, if, they, if you're serving more than six years or six years of service, it's so quite a lot of service uh, in the British Army or which are service you, you're serving, and not having your family with you and having to pay, say you've got three kids and you have to pay. £2,500 each and then for your wife, uh, it's £10,000. It's an absolute disgrace and uh, I'm glad the party opposite agree on point C, but uh, nobody who serves a country should have to pay money for their children and spouses to be with them in the same country after we've asked them to come and join the British Army and defend our country. It's absolutely nonsensical. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Bones. Thank you, Chair. Um, just two points to make, really, which is, the first one is, if you are genuinely serious about wanting to bring back a motion on this with cross-party support, I think Councillor Bartoli's made it very clear that we would be happy to support points B and point C of this motion. And just regarding Councillor Johnston's point um, about the protocol, for the UN protocol on uh, refugees, which Councillor Westwater described, Councillor Johnston said that was a ludicrous protocol. We've been part of that for nearly 70 years. It was, it was signed, we were signed into it um, under Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister. It is an internationally recognised that you seek refuge in the first safe country you arrive in. Thank you. Point of personal observation again, Chair. I did not say it was a ludicrous protocol. I said Council Westwater was, was Council Westwater's suggestion was ludicrous. Councillor Early. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to pick up on the point that this, this uh, motion talks about refugees. Both Councillor Bartoli and Councillor Westforder have described um, the people who are the subject of this, this motion as migrants. Um, we're not talking about migrants, we're talking about refugees who have the same um, need to seek refuge as uh, the unfortunate refugees from, from the Ukraine who we unanimous, unanimously supported earlier in the evening and I don't think that's a, a fair and proper di distinction to be made. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Early. Councillor Wallace. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to pick up on what Councillor Gary Bell has said with regard to the um, uh, people coming across the English Channel. I think we need to look very carefully at what this trade in sending people across the Channel in rickety boats actually is. It's putting the, ha the money, it's often significant sums of money, in the hands of people smugg smugglers who are exploiting people, putting them at danger, putting them in rickety craft, across one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world, the English Channel. We should all want to stop that trade, and that's what the government is trying to do. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. I'm going to move it on now. Um, could I ask to move the motion to exercise the right of reply, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first off, I'm, I'm glad that we're now all in agreement that Commonwealth veterans shouldn't have to pay extortionate fees to uh, stay in the UK. That's a that's a change from the last time it came, so I want to thank you for now publicly stating that you believe that. Um, look, we could have made it a very political motion. We could have made the motion as it stands, as it's written, incredibly political. I know I touched slightly on politics in my address, but I could have made it exceptionally pol political. I, I decided not to. I decided to rein it back because it's too important. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to try and be kind, we have a situation here where what the government means to do and what the government has done, or maybe the law of unintended consequences, or maybe they meant to do something, but actually when the bill's been wrote, it actually does something else. That's why the Lords have voted it down and said the clause should be removed, because it doesn't do what it's designed to do. It, in fact, it effectively makes a two-tier system. I completely agree that the trade of trying to hold people into rickety boats going across uh, the, one of the busiest shipping lanes in, in the world is something that needs to be tackled. But you tackle it by punishing the people who do it, not the refugees who need help. And it goes back to a principle, what I said at the beginning, uh, when I introduced the, uh, the motion. It comes down to the principle that refugees should be given a status based upon their needs, not their method of travel. People who want our protection should be given that protection based upon the merits of their case. And that what this go, that's what this goes down to. So regardless of what the government intended to do with Clause 11, regardless of what the narrative is from Westminster, the effect of Clause 11 is to make a two-tier system in which certain refugees will not be given full rights for up to 10 years and will be pushed into, um, into, into extreme poverty and potentially exploitation. And I think that the government should do something about um, migrant, uh, the, the, the crossing trade at the, um, at the channel, but I don't believe Clause 11 will have the effect they want, and I don't think it's going to make any difference. But I'm not an expert. I, I'm a councillor for North Tyneside Council, so I am going to quote somebody who is an expert, called Larry uh, Butnick, who is the UN Refugee Agency's representative in the UK. And he said that the dynamics behind the channel crossings are extremely complex and there is no single solution. There is, however, a real risk of compounding the problem with measures that are not, uh, sorry, not fit for purpose. Um, he also says that stronger working with the European Union is the key to tackling the crisis. Uh, but he says that the measures proposed in the bill are extremely unlikely to, to, uh, to achieve their stated objective. They will, however, inflict suffering and increase the inefficiencies at the cost of asylum seekers in the UK. And they will undermine the international protection regime globally. Now, that's from an expert. That's not from me, who's sitting in North Tyneside Council. That is from an expert. And it goes back, and I'm going to finish very quickly by going back to what I said right at the beginning um, of, of, of these comments. It doesn't matter what the government intended to do. It matters what it will do and the bill will create a two-tier um, system. So if you say that you will not vote for this motion because of point A, you are essentially saying you agree that refugees should be treated differently purely on how they travel to the UK, which I think is immoral. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Uh, and I will go to the vote on this motion. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Linda Arkley, Councillor Lewis Bartoli, yeah. Councillor Gary Bell, Councillor Linda Bell, 
Councillor Liam Bones. Again. Councillor Trish Brady. Four. Councillor Sean Brockbank. Again. Councillor Brian Burdis. Four. Councillor Carol Burdis. Four. Councillor Karen Clark. Four. Councillor Debbie Cox. Four. Councillor Stephen Cox. Four. Councillor Naomi Craven. Four. Councillor Julie Crudis. Four. Councillor Eddie Dark. Four. Councillor Linda Dark. Councillor Sarah Day. Councillor David Drummond. Four. Councillor Peter Early. Four. Councillor Sandra Graham. Four. Councillor Muriel Green. Four. Councillor Margaret Hall. Four. Councillor Tracy Hallway. Four. Councillor John Harrison. Four. Councillor Janet Hunter. Four. Councillor John Hunter. Four. Councillor Carl Johnson. Four. Councillor Hannah Johnson. Four. Councillor Christopher Johnston. Councillor Joe Kerwin. Councillor Wendy Lott. Councillor Gary Madden. Councillor Maureen Madden. Councillor Pamela McIntyre. Councillor Anthony McMullen. Councillor Janice Small. Councillor Jim Montague. Councillor Thomas Mulvenna. Councillor Andy Newman. Councillor Pat Oliver. Councillor John O'Shea. Councillor Councillor Norman Percy. Councillor Stephen Phillips. Councillor Bruce Pickard. Councillor Martin Rankin. Norma Redfin, elected mayor. Councillor Paul Richardson. Councillor Willie Samuel. Councillor Jane Shaw. Councillor Martin Matthew Thurloway. Councillor Joan Walker. Councillor Judith Wallace. Councillor George Westwater. And Councillor Matt Wilson. Motion's carried 46 to 8. I'm just going to propose we're going to have a 10 minute uh, comfort break. Carry on, please. We're going to have a 10 minute comfort break. Eight, now everybody's back. Uh, item number five. Six, sorry. Somebody's been scribbling on my paper. Peer policy review. It was five. Can I ask my, uh, Councillor Rankin to move the report, please? Thank you, Chair. It's unanimous two split votes for at the moment, but this report does always go through unanimously, so I am hopeful of pulling one back here. Under the Localism Act 2011, it is re a requirement that the local authority publish its pay policy statement by the 1st of April. This statement sets out our policies on a range of matters relating to the pay terms and conditions of our employees. The statement promotes transparent government governance <coughs> and demonstrates the authority sets fair and consistent pay and demonstrates value for money. It, outlined, it, it outlines current practice on a range of matters such as pay, grading structures and job evaluation and the terms and conditions in relation to the pay chief officers. Key areas for the Council to note this year are as follows. Average salary has moved from 23,500 to 25,700, meaning a reduction in the pay multiple from one to seven times to one to six times. The new pay scale is effective from the 1st of April 2022, but remains subject to national negotiations in some areas. Any increase will be backdated once finalised. Full Council agreed in November 2020 that the North Tainted living wage of £9.50 per hour should be paid from April 2021. I'm delighted to see that this was implemented from December 21 and will be backdated accordingly. And the central government exit pay cap was introduced in November 2020, but then revoked just three months later due to its apparent unintended consequences. The unintended consequences was that, unfortunately, it was illegal. The <coughs> government is yet to announce a replacement for this. I would ask the chamber to accept the recommendation of 1.2 of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rankin. Rankin. Councillor Johnson, would you like to second the motion? The report, yeah. Are there any questions? No questions? Yes. Sorry? Councillor Hawley. I would just like to ask uh, if any changes would be coming back to full council. If any changes, there won't be any changes now. 
this is the this is the report. So there'll be no further changes this year. This is the pay policy. Any further questions? Can I now invite members to speak the motion? Councillor Brockbank. Probably just to save time and to um, to reassure Councillor Rankin, we fully support the report. So we're quite happy to move to the vote. I said we have a great reply. Green. We'll move to the vote then. All those in favour? Unanimous. Unanimous, thank you. This is statutory rules. Can I ask the elected mayor to move the report, please? Thank you, I, thank you, Chairman. Sorry. The authority is required to designate an officer of the authority as the monitoring officer. This is required by the Local Government and Housing Act 1989. The authority must also appoint an electoral registration officer and a returning officer. This is required by the Repres Representation of the People Act 1983. As members are aware, the Director of Law and Governance who held these roles, Bryn Roberts, has now left the authority. The authority is therefore required to reallocate those roles to other officers. It is therefore proposed that Jacqueline Lawton, the authority's assistant chief executive, will be designated as monitoring officer from the 17th of March 2022. This designation will remain in place on an interim basis pending completion of a review of the structure of the senior leadership team. It is proposed that the roles of the electoral registration officer and returning officer are undertaken by Paul Hansen. Chief Executive from the 17th of March 2022. I would therefore like to move the recommendation set out in this report, which will enable the authority to fulfil its duties to the statutory roles referred to in this report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, elected Mayor. Do I have a seconder? Second report, Chair, was that I speak? Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Are there any questions? <coughs> I invite members to speak. Councillor Brockbank. Uh, again, uh, we're, we absolutely support um, what's on the report and recommendations. We've got absolute confidence in the individuals put forward, so uh, there was no, no objections from our side. That's the case. I'll move straight to the vote. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. Let's wait a short while. Paul Hansen comes back in. I move on to Chair's announcements. Uh, I'd like to wish everybody good luck in the forthcoming elections. And I would like to give the opportunity to anybody who is not standing the chance to address the Council. If anybody wishes to speak, could indicate. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Dobb. I'd just like to say a few words as I stand down from 18 years at Councillor for Kilnworth Ward. It's been an honour to have represented the residents of Kilnworth Ward for the last 18 years. There have been good times for our way and the not so good times. I've met some lovely people during yeah. that time, but you know what they say, you can't please all of the people all of the time. I've tried my best to help everyone who has contacted me, but I always say they don't give you a magic wand when you get elected to the council. You can't fix everything for everyone. My motto has been, if you can't do a good turn, don't do a bad one. Anyway, that's enough from me. Goodbye to everyone I've met in the council. You'll get some peace now. Thank you.
Charles the Hunter. No, Peter Sorry. Peter. Councillor Early. Uh, I'm no more in Madden. Sorry. Sorry. Councillor Madden. Sorry. Sorry. Did you see me? Yes. I thought that seeing tonight will be my last council meeting as an elected member that it is right to give a vote of thanks to a number of people, including myself. I have served as a councillor for 21 years, representing the residents of Benton Ward and Howden Ward. I have been proud to do so, and I have carried out those duties to the best of my abilities, without fear or favour, both inside and outside the council. I have never been afraid to challenge decisions that I believed were wrong, and this has at times caused controversy and confrontation. But I see that as part of the role of a councillor. We should never be afraid to ask for cha to challenge decisions. I would like to thank John Harrison and John Hunter, my two colleagues in Howden Ward, for their support and working as a team with me over the years. I would like to thank the officers and staff of North Tyneside Council, who I have worked also with over a number of years. I would also like to thank my friends and councillor comrades for their support during my good and not so good times. You know who you are and thank you. I am proud that we have acted upon the policy of women only shortlists and because of this nominated five strong committed political women to stand in the forthcoming elections and wish them every success in May. I am even prouder that I played a part in supporting our first woman BAM nominee to be one of those five women. And I hope there will be more BAM candidates in the future to make this council truly representative of the communities we serve. I would all like, also like to say good luck and I will continue as a socialist and trade unionist as I have done for the past 45 years and I will remain a political activist just in different roles in the future. And although this is my final council meeting as a councillor, I will be, at times, um, worried about the fact and how the council is going and will attend, possibly, a lot of council meetings, but from the public gallery. And I still ask them awkward questions or controversial questions in the future. Can I wish all the councillors in the chamber tonight um, success in the May elections? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mann. Councillor Early. Thank you, Chair. I find myself in the unwelcome position of having to speak about standing down as a councillor when, truth be told, I would very much have liked to have had the opportunity to stand again in May and continue in the role. I was first elected as a councillor in 2014 at the tender age of 52, just a kid with a head full of crazy dreams. <laughs> I have been a Benton Ward councillor for eight years and have always tried to work as hard as I could and to the best of my ability to help the residents of my ward and the residents of North Tyneside in general. Hopefully I have improved the, residents, uh, the lives of residents in the ward, but of course those improvements would not have been possible without the hard work, support and friendship of my outstanding fellow ward councillors, Janet Hunter and Pat Oliver. I recall that my great-grandfather served as a councillor in Wall's End in the early 20th century and that my father served the people of this borough as a civil engineer and ultimately chief engineer for over 30 years. So I am proud to have been able to continue the early family tradition of serving the people of North Tyneside. Over the last four years, I have had the additional privilege of serving as cabinet member for children, young people and learning. Although it was a somewhat daunting role initially, I found the role to be extremely rewarding. I am not sure that there could be a more important role than one which has allowed me to con contribute to the support and development of our children and young people in North Tyneside. As someone once said, politics should not be about the next election, but about the next generation. Whilst my time as a cabinet member has, I believe, seen many successes and advances in the way that we care for, protect and educate our young people, my part in those successes has been small. The vast majority of the credit goes to the officers, social workers and other childcare professionals across my portfolio area. It has been a humbling experience to see, <laughs> without exception, the level of skill, knowledge and above all dedication the staff across my portfolio have exhibited over the last four years. I hope members will permit me an indulgence if I name some of them. In particular, I would like to thank Jackie Old, Julie Firth, Diane Buckle, Kevin Burns, Mark Barrett, Mark Longstaff, Rob Smith, 
the staff of the Mayor's Office and, of course, the senior leadership team for their expertise and support. I am also very gratified for all, all the kind words and support I have received over the last few weeks since it became clear that I would not be returning in May, particularly from the Mayor, fellow, fellow Cabinet members, many fellow councillors, some officers and the chairs of several outside bodies upon which I have served. Unfortunately for me, the only body which does not seem to share in this regard for my efforts is the one that matters most when seeking re-election, my local Labour branch of Benton. Having been a member of the branch for over a decade and work with many of its members, it is a grave disappointment to me that members of my branch, albeit narrowly, did not see merit in my reselection. However, as Harry S. Truman once said of expecting loyalty in politics, if you want loyalty, buy a dog. <laughs> So I go reluctantly, but with gratitude that I've been able to be part of an outstanding Labour Council, which I believe has, and I'm sure will continue to do great things for the residents of North Tyneside. And I'll leave you with one last quote from no lesser philosopher than Dr. Seuss. Don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. Thank you. I believe a few members who want to speak about their uh, colleagues, uh, Janet Hunter. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to say a few words about Councillor Early. Peter will be a huge loss to North Tyneside Council. He's a person who is very well respected by members and officers alike. And after being Chair of Regulation and Review for a number of years, for the last four, he's been an incredibly hard-working Cabinet member for children and young people. He doesn't take things on lightly and he's immersed himself completely in getting to know and understand his very wide-ranging portfolio to ensure he's able to lead on policy and strategic developments. Under his very able leadership, the Council has obtained outstanding offset reports for children's services and the youth, youth justice service. And very recently, a SEND inspection said services for children with complex needs are strong. North Tyneside is the only authority in England that has the consistency of these three achievements. He not only attends cabinet meetings, but he's been diligent in ensuring he attends the many external bodies that cover the children and young people's portfolio. And as a non-driver, Peter travels to them in Sunderland, Durham, Newcastle and Northumberland on buses and trains. Locally, the residents of Benton will also be losers. For the past eight years, Peter has worked tirelessly, knocking on every door in the ward at least once a year, writing and delivering leaflets, doing street surgeries and holding ward council surgeries, and supporting local community groups, particularly those involving young people. And that's as well as helping residents with their queries and concerns, nearly 800 of them. Pat and I will miss him too. We had a great team supporting each other and working well together, I think. Even if we have, I'm sorry, Peter, mothered you and bossed you a little bit. You know, is your coat warm enough? Don't you need a hat on today? I'm sure you won't miss any of that. But, you know, we are going to miss the camaraderie, the commitment and the friendship that's helped us deliver for the residents of Benton. Hopefully we'll see you back in the not too distant future, Peter. I believe the gentleman chair would like to speak. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I would like to associate myself with everything Janet has just said. We are both extremely disappointed and upset that Peter will not be standing in Benton this year. For the last eight years, we have all worked together as a team for the benefit of our residents, and over the years, we've become great friends. Peter has been an outstanding Cabinet Member for Children, as shown by recent Ofsted and SEND reports. You will all have seen the email which Mayor Redfern circulated from Jane Streeter, who was chair of the North East Child Poverty Commission. Jane out was, was outlining Peter's commitment to prioritising tackling child poverty in North Tyneside and how much this has been appreciated and also her regret that he will no longer be in that position. I've been a member of the Corporate Parenting Forum for several years and Peter has totally revitalised it, throwing it open to other members and encouraging their commitment and involvement on such an important committee. He can be like a terrier on behalf of his residents. 
I'm thinking about the disabled parking bay, Peter. Peter has a very dry sense of humour, although I did sorely test it the day I put us on the wrong train, when we were supposed to be travelling to Durham to share good practice. I told him that we were taking the scenic route via Darlington. He wasn't impressed. We were a bit late. Mind you, I haven't quite forgotten him for the rat gag. Peter, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, Peter, Janet and I are going to miss you more than you will ever know. And we are hoping to see you back at the council very soon where you belong. Thank you. Thank you. Now we want to eight and Sorry, Councillor, I thought I did have you down. Trust me, Chair, I'm sick of speaking as well. <laughs> Chair, um, while Councillor Linda Bell will be standing for election in May, she won't be standing for re-election in Walls End Board, the area she has represented for eight years. Linda is a hard-working councillor committed to representing and improving the lives of the people in North Tyneside. I know she will be sorely missed by local residents in Walls End Ward. I greatly admire her honest, plain speaking, down to earth, common sense approach to her role as councillor and to politics in general. With her bold and cheerful personality, Linda is the sort of person who will have a conversation with anyone and everyone when door knocking or leafleting, including the numerous dogs and dog walkers we've met while out and about over the years. <laughs> I would like to thank Linda for all, the, for all the help and support she has given me since I was first elected. It is a joy to work with, Li with Linda, and I couldn't have asked for a better ward colleague and friend. I look forward to welcoming, welcoming Linda back as the newest council for Northumberland Ward at our next meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thurlow. Councillor John Hunter. Thanks, Chair. I'd just like to thank Maureen Madden since, she's, since I've been a councillor, she's been a councillor in Howden, and I think she'll be a big miss from Howden, and I'll miss her because she's been a good colleague, and I think John would probably back me up on that. And I've just to say, best to look to Maureen for what she's going to do next. Thank you. Councillor Kerwin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I didn't intend to speak, but I, I felt moved to because we haven't mentioned them yet. Um, but Councillor Brady um, and Councillor Mole, who are also not seeking re-election, um, they were both elected um, four years ago, like myself. Um, and it's been quite a strange four years. I think not many new councillors in their first terms would have experienced a worldwide pandemic. Um, but I would just like, just like to thank them both for their friendship and support over the past four years. Um, being newbies during that time wasn't always easy. Navigating, finding ways around wasn't always easy, but we did it as a bit of a gang and their support was always welcomed and I will sorely miss them both from the council. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chairman. Lis listening to all that just reminds me that politics is a strange game. A strange game. But I'd just like to... Are you waving at me? Oh, sorry. I thought you were going like this. I just want to take, take this opportunity to thank all the councillors who are standing down and leaving us, to be quite honest. Every one of you actually have been amazing, have worked hard, given me a great deal of support, and I, I'm going to miss some of you, really, to be quite honest, for that kind of support that you need when you're at the top of the tree and everybody wants to have a go at you to be quiet. And so to have all you people who have been absolutely supportive, thank you very much indeed. I am sad. We are all losing some very, very, very good councillors, to be quite honest. And I know the ones who are out there with us every time we're knocking on doors and lifting in, to be quite honest. We're going to miss you all. Perhaps some of you might come back again and uh, help us, no doubt, again. I look forward to some of you, actually, this year, being brave enough, or actually sort of uh, been persuaded enough to come back and put your name on the list to come back as yeah. councillors. You have been absolutely splendid. Peter, a huge thank you for what you've done for our young people in North Tyneside in that role as Cabinet Member. Thank you to all, everyone. 
Councillor Montague. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to add to uh, Councillor Coburn's thanks to Councillor Brady um, in supporting me into easing me into the, uh, the, 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 the workings of Northumberland Ward, I suppose, um, and supporting me and giving me some advice and her knowledge uh, that she's built up over the last four years. Thanks, Councillor Brady. Thank you. Okay, move on to item number eight. Blackburn Mayor. My Your announcements. Chair Chairman, um, we've all seen the tragic scenes unfolding in the Ukraine, the harrowing, harrowing rea realities of war ripping communities apart, and terrified families fleeing as their homes are destroyed, and devastating images of loss and heartbreak. For me, and I'm sure for you people in this council tonight, it's impossible to understand what the people of the Ukraine are going through. My deepest sympathies and condolences go out to every family affected, including those Ukrainian nationalists who call North Tyneside home, and there are many. On behalf of you and North Tyneside Council, I would like to say that we stand in solidarity with the people of the Ukraine and strongly condemn the Russian invasion of this country. I, like you, am personally proud that we are flying the Ukrainian flag in locations right across the borough, including here in the council chamber this evening. We have illuminated buildings with the colors of the Ukrainian flag and shown our full support wherever we can. North Tyneside has already displayed incredible generosity, generosity to the people of Ukraine. And I am extremely proud, and I would like to thank councillors from all sides of the chamber for their efforts in collecting items from their communities. For anyone who is still hoping to donate the most beneficial ways to make a financial donation to well-established organisations, such as UNICEF or the Red Cross, these organisations will get the right support, the right people, at the right time. North Tyneside has a long-standing history of supporting people, people who are looking for safety and sanctuary. We are welcoming any refugee to our borough and will continue to support the government's plans and local organisations who can provide support to anyone applying in North Tyneside. Our thoughts will continue to be with anyone affected by this conflict, which I hope, like you, will be resolved soon. And I hope you will now join me in a moment of reflection before we move on to the next item of business. Could you please stand, please, for that, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please Thank you. Thank you. Move on to item number nine. Questions to members of the council. Uh, three valid questions have been received from members of the council. Question one, Councillor Bones. Thank you, like Chair. To ask, ask the question or take it as read. Ask it. Thank you, Chair. At the council meeting in January, the mayor stated that she uses her red fiesta to get around the borough and she only uses the civic car for civic business. Can the mayor therefore confirm if she or her cabinet use the civic car for authority appointments to outside body meetings? 
Councillor Johnson Sanson. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I'll be answering this one on behalf of the Mayor. As has been the case for all previous elected mayors, the civic car can be used for attendance at civic business. This includes attendance at outside bodies, where they attend a meeting representing the borough. The civic car is not available for private use. I think we have to reflect, Chair, on this question. The civic car has been used constantly, whether it was Conservative or the Labour Party in the morality, used by different mayors, different chairs. It's mainly used by the chair of the council as opposed to the mayor of the cabinet. The chair of the council rightly has a chain around his neck that is pretty valuable. Um, with, if the civic car wasn't there, that chain would have to be insured. If premium, premium cost goes up. It's also a noteworthy chair, the number of uses. I'm not going to get into you use it more than us, but that is a factual figure. You did. Also, on the, it's quick, the tone of the question is trying to assertion that it's not quite right to use it for certain things. I certainly know it's not quite right to use Civic Car for Ferry and David Cameron and Wendy Morton around the borough chair. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Bones? Thank you, Chair. It's rather telling that this question addressed to the Mayor is again being answered by the Cabinet member. Figures reveal that five, in the last five years there have been 46 questions from members of the public and she's only answered two of them herself. When the Conservative group raised this in a motion, the Labour chair blocked it on grounds it was improper to question whether well, the Councillor Bones, this is not related. It, it, it's, it's not related. Chair, I've, just, I've just spoke the legal. Chair, I'm getting that. Well, was taking whether the Mayor was taking her responsibility seriously. Councillor Bones. Excuse me, Chair. Excuse me. Excuse, I'm running this meeting, not you. I've just been talking to legal. And the question you come, what you're coming up with has nothing to do with what, you, what you're you, talking about. Chair, you don't Listen. know the question I'm coming up with. I've got the question in front of me. Well, get to the if point you, then. Well, if you'd let me finish, I would. Thank well, you, Chair. Excuse me. I'm running this meeting, not you. There's no need to raise I, your voice, Chair. There's every need to raise my voice. You, you're talking over the top of me. I'm running this meeting, not you. So either get to the point or leave. Well, maybe I'll have a better look getting the Mayor to answer my supplementary question. Given the answer we've just had about the use of the civic car to outside bodies, there is clearly a log of when, where and why the car is used. Will the Mayor commit to providing the public with a clear overview of where their council tax is being spent by publishing the log for the past four years of the, of the car use and every year going forward? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Johnson, would you like to reply? I know that... Councillor Bones quite deliberately didn't include any time when the Conservatives were using the car. The civic car is used by both Conservatives and Labour for civic business. It's used quite rightly to attack. It's another Conservative culture war. Constantly, Councillor Bones is thinking of culture wars to try and get an article on his favourite Northfield's Life programme. That's what Councillor Bones consists of in terms of asking Council questions. We will look at the log to see how far back the history goes and we'll see what we can publish to ensure that residents. But if we are to publish it, we will publish it from the very start when we have logs of when it was used. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I remind everybody that when I'm making a ruling, you don't talk over the top of me, and that goes for everybody on both sides. We want to question two. You can't, it's, 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 it's just not about part of the, the question. Using the car. You can't, the can't do it, John. Sorry. Question two, Councillor Eddie Dock. Do you wish to ask a question? Any castle game? Can I just take it as red? Take it as red. <laughs> Chairman, point of order under 4.1 of the Constitution. Um, we would contend this is an improper question because, as it is inaccurate, um, the, the member's inquiry system is not intended. Um, purely to advise residents. It, it is to be used by councillors to raise concerns as well, so it's, it, it is inaccurate and should, shouldn't be allowed. Councillor Brockbank, I made a ruling on this last week. Uh, I took legal advice on it. You can't challenge my decision uh, once I've took legal advice. Do you want me to answer it, Chair? Answer it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the member's inquiry system can be used by members to raise queries either on behalf of residents or in their own name. For members of the Conservative group, the proportion of inquiries raised on their own behalf for the period from May 2021 to date ranges, ranges, ranges rather from 
to 87%. And there is a table available if you want to see it. Uh, the breakdown for the Labour group is also available and ranges, ranges from 0% to 90%. That table is available if you want to see it. The Constitution sets out the purpose of the Members' Inquiry System, which is both the queries on behalf of residents, but also for members in their own name. This was further confirmed via an email to all members on the 6th of August, 2021. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Question number three, Council Westwater. Uh, sorry, sorry supplementary question. I just want to see the match. <laughs> yeah, take the questions read, thank you. The question is read. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Council will recall from the meeting of November 21 the commemoration project proposal was subject to public engagement rather than full consultation. All residents will have the opportunity to choose their preferred choice of artwork for the centre and the compasses in each locality of the borough. All feedback received from our residents and the wider community has been extremely positive. There was a clear preference for the choice of our work in all four localities. These areas for reflection and the compasses that are central to them are all about the spirit of North Tyneside, which is something that always shines through from our bor borough and communities. And it's something which I'm incredibly proud to be part of. The current preparation, installation of stonework and associated materials and the provision of seating and interpretation boards is all part of the cost. It's also wider work in terms of our wagon ways that also forms part of this cost, not £250,000 for stones. Council will be aware of part of the ambition for North Tyson proposals, a group of cabinet in November 2018. Investing in our mining heritage, including the wagonways, was key to our proposals. This is also agreed by cabinet in February 2022. When update report is considered, we wish specific references made to link the Cove Memorial with the wagonway schemes. As only fitting that the authority has its first central commemoration area ready for our residents in time for the National Day of Reflection on the 23rd of March. I also have progress and work required to secure the early delivery of the commemoration areas rather than delaying matters further for cross-party consideration. I was, however, confident that we had full council support for the proposals which I explained were also on display outside the chamber in November. If Councillor, Bar if Councillor West was in that case, then I would apologise for that, but it was quite clearly a cross-party motion passed in November. I am pleased be confirmed that officers are working to plant almost 9,000 trees across the borough this planting season in line with the authority's tree planting policy, which all of our residents can enjoy. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Westwood? Much, thank you. Uh, does the Cabinet Member or the Mayor agree that unanimous cross-party decisions agreed in the Chamber should be carried through? Chair, as I just said before, I believe that this decision that we agreed to have a Cove Memorial, this Cove Memorial, it's very important we get this memorial in by the 23rd of March, a National Reflection Day. Um, that's why we went ahead and did this. We thought we had cross white sport. Clearly, if you don't support Cove Memorial or you would just have a tree, we, pl we wanted a memorial that is fitting for the lives that have been impacted in this last year, and we went ahead and did that. Of the £250,000, as you're going to, the latest culture war, um, the £250,000 is not just for stones, it's about improvements to just our wagonways, it is about the memorial itself, the areas around the wagonways and linking them. We anticipate that £75,000 of this cost being met by Section 1 of 6 money as well. All of the resources were locally prepared and made and public consultation concluded in 2020 too was entirely positive about these proposals. I know, I know councillor, the council's officer keep referencing residents that contact them. The residents that contact them are of some sort of favour because they never turn up at the ballot box. They always return to Labour councillors right across the borough. But these mystery residents always tell you that what is completely opposite to public consultation. If there are that many residents banging down the doors of Conservative councillors, there might be more than nine of them set opposite me, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. That's the end of the questions. The next full council meeting is the annual general meeting. And it's scheduled to take place on the 19th of May 2022. And details will be posted on the Council's website in due course. That's the end of business for the meeting. I'd like to thank everybody for attending and good luck to everybody in May and good luck to everybody who's standing down. Thank you.